Chapter 10 of Poems of American History, Volume 4, The Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Poems of American History, Volume 4, The Civil War by Various. Chapter 10, The Final Struggle. A survey of the field at the opening of the fourth year of the war, shows how steadily the North had been gaining the advantage, an advantage due to superior numbers and greater resources, rather than to brilliant generalship. The Union forces in the field numbered 800,000, while the Confederates had scarcely half as many, and were compelled to stand on the defensive. The North hoped to crush them by one mighty effort. Put it through, 1864. Come, freemen of the land, come meet the last demand. Here's a piece of work in hand, put it through. Here's a log across the way we have stumbled on all day. Here's a plowshare in the clay, put it through. Here's a country that's half free, and it waits for you and me to say what its fate shall be, put it through. While one traitor thought remains, while one spot its banner stains, one link of all its chains, put it through. Here our brothers in the field, steal your swords as theirs are steeled, Learn to wield the arms they wield. Put it through. Lock the shop and lock the store, And chalk this upon the door. We've enlisted for the war. Put it through. For the birthrights yet unsold, For the history yet untold, For the future yet unrolled. Put it through. Lest our children point with shame On the father's dastard fame, who gave up a nation's name, put it through. Edward Everett Hale Grant was made lieutenant general and prepared to advance on Richmond, while the task of taking Atlanta was entrusted to Sherman. Sherman began his advance without delay and was before Atlanta by the middle of July 1864. On the 20th, the Confederates made a desperate sally, but were driven back. Logan at Peach Tree Creek. A Veteran's Story. July 20th, 1864. You know that day at Peach Tree Creek, when the Rebs were there circling scorching wall of smoke-hid cannon and sweep of flame, drove in our flanks back, back, and all? Our toil seemed lost in the storm of shell. That desperate day McPherson fell. Our regiment stood in a little glade set round with half-grown red oak trees. An awful place to stand in full fair sight while the many bullets hummed like bees and comrades dropped on either side. That fearful day McPherson died. The roar of the battle, steady, stern, rung in our ears, upon our eyes, the belching cannon smoke, the half-hid swing of deploying troops, the groans, the cries, the hoarse commands, the sickening smell, that blood-red day McPherson fell. But we stood there when out from the trees, out of the smoke in dismay to the right, burst a rider, his head was bare, his eye had a blaze like a lion fain for fight. His long hair, black as the deepest night, streamed out on the wind, and the might of his plunging horse was a tale to tell, and his voice rang high like a bugle swell. Men, the enemy hem us on every side, we'll whip him yet. Close up that breach, remember your flag, don't give an inch. The right flanks gaining and soon will reach. Forward, boys, and give him hell, said Logan, after McPherson fell. We laughed and cheered, and the red ground shook as the general plunged along the line. 
through the deadliest rain of screaming shells for the sound of his voice refreshed us all and we filled the gap like a roaring tide and saved the day mcpherson died but that was twenty years ago and part of a horrible dream now past for logan the lion the drums throb blow and the flag swings low on the mast he has followed his mighty chieftain through the mist-hung stream where gray and blue one color stand and north to south extends the hand it's right that deeds of war and blood should be forgot but spite of all i think of logan now as he rode the day across the field i hear the call of his trumpet voice see the battle shine in his stern black eyes and down the line of cheering men i see him ride as on the day mcpherson died hamlin garland on july twenty second eighteen sixty four sherman ordered a general assault which lasted two days with heavy losses on both sides general mcpherson was killed by a confederate sharpshooter about noon of the first day a dirge for mcpherson killed in front of atlanta july twenty second eighteen sixty four arms reversed and banners creeped muffled drums snowy horses sable draped mcpherson comes but tell us shall we know him more lost mountain and lone kennesaw brave the sword upon the pall a gleam in gloom so bright a name lighteth all mcpherson's doom bear him through the chapel door let priest in stole pace before the warrior who led bell toll lay him down within the nave the lesson read man is noble man is brave but man's a weed take him up again and wend graveward nor weep there's a trumpet that shall rend this soldier's sleep pass the ropes the coffin round and let descend prayer and volley let it sound mcpherson's end true fame is his for life is over sarpedon of the mighty war herman melville hostilities continued about atlanta for nearly a month and finally on september second eighteen sixty four the confederates evacuated the city a few days later they suddenly attacked alatoona where general course was stationed with a small garrison sherman heard the thunder of the guns from the top of kennesaw mountain and signaled course the famous message hold out relief is coming course did hold out and the confederates finally withdrew with course at alatoona october fifth eighteen sixty four it was less than two thousand we numbered in the fort sitting up on the hill that night not a soldier that slumbered we watched by the starlight until daybreak showed us all of their forces about us their gray columns ran to left and to right they were round us five thousand if there was a man surrender your fort bawled the rebel five minutes i give or you're dead not a man answered course in his treble perhaps you can take us instead then pealed forth their cannon infernal we fought them outside of the pass two hours the time seemed eternal the dead lay in lines on the grass but who cared for dead or for dying the fort we were there to defend and across from yon far mountain flying came a message hold on to the end hold on to the fort it was sherman who signalled from kennesaw's height far over the heads of our foemen hold on i am coming to-night quick fluttered our flag to the signal we answered him back with a will, and fired on the gray-coated rebels that charged up the slope of the hill. Low double, cried Course, every cannon, who cares for their ten to our one? We looked at the swift-coming rebels, and answered their yell with a gun. With the grape from our fort in their faces, they rushed to the ramparts but stop. Ah, few of the gray-columned army that day left alive at the top on the parapets too lie our wounded 
each porthole a grave for the dead. No room for our cannon, the corpses fill up the embrasures instead. Again through the cannon's red weather, they charge up the hill and the pass. Their dead and our dead lie together out there on the slope in the grass. A crash from our rifles they falter, a gleam from our steel it is by. Recall and retreat, sound their bugles. We cheer from the fort as they fly. Once more and the signal is flying. How many the wounded and dead? Six hundred, says Corse, with the dying. The blood streaming down from his head. But what of that? Look, the old banner. Shines out there as peaceful and still as if there had not been a battle this morning up there on the hill. Samuel H. M. Byers Alatoona, October 5, 1864 Winds that sweep the southern mountains and the leafy river shore, bear ye now a prouder burden than ye ever learned before, and the heart blood fills, the heart till it thrills at the story of the terror and the glory of this battle of the Alatoona Hills. Echo it from the purple mountain to the gray resounding shore. Tis as sad and proud a burden as ye ever learned before. How they fell like grass when the mowers pass, and the dying when the foe were flying, swelled the cheering of the heroes of the pass. Sweep it over the hills of Georgia to the mountains of the north. Teach the coward and the doubter what the blood of man is worth. Toss the flags as ye pass, let their stained and tattered mass tell the story of the terror and the glory of the battle of the Alatoona Pass. Sherman now prepared for a maneuver which was destined to be the most famous of the war. He determined to destroy Atlanta, and marching through the heart of Georgia to capture one or more of the important seaport towns. On November 16, 1864, the famous March to the Sea began. Sherman's March to the Sea Our campfires shone bright on the mountain, that frowned on the river below, as we stood by our guns in the morning and eagerly watched for the foe. When a rider came out of the darkness, that hung over mountain and tree, and shouted, Boys, up and be ready, for Sherman will march to the sea. Then cheer upon cheer for bold Sherman went up from each valley and glen, and the bugles re-echoed the music that came from the lips of the men. For we knew that the stars in our banner more bright in their splendor would be, and that blessings from Northland would greet us when Sherman marched down to the sea. Then forward, boys, forward to battle. We marched on our wearisome way. We stormed the wild hills of Rusaka. God bless those who fell on that day. Then Kennesaw, dark in its glory, frowned down on the flag of the free. And the east and the west bore our standard, and Sherman marched on to the sea. Still onward we pressed till our banners swept out from Atlanta's grim walls, and the blood of the patriot dampened the soil where the traitor flag falls. We pause not to weep for the fallen, who slept by each river and tree, yet we twine them with the wreath of the laurel as Sherman marched down to the sea. O oh, proud was our army that morning that stood where the pine darkly towers, where Sherman said, Boys, you are weary, but today fair Savannah is ours. Then sang we the song of our chieftain that echoed over the river and the lee, and the stars in our banner shone brighter when Sherman marched down to the sea. Samuel H. M. Byers Through the heart of Georgia the army moved, leaving behind a path of ruin forty miles in width. Some of this destruction was no doubt necessary but much of it seems to have been wanton and without reason. The Song of Sherman's Army 
a pillar of fire by night a pillar of smoke by day some hours of march then a halt to fight and so we hold our way some hours of march then a halt to a fight is on we hold our way over mountain and plain and stream to some bright atlantic bay with our arms aflash in the morning beam we hold our festal way with our arms aflash in the morning beam we hold our checkless way there is terror wherever we come there is terror in wild dismay when they see the old flag and hear the drum announce us on our way when they see the old flag and hear the drum beating time to our onward way never unlimber a gun for those villainous lines in gray draw sabres and anim upon the run tis thus we clear our way draw sabres and soon you will see them run as we hold our conquering way the loyal who long have been dumb are loud in their cheers to-day and the old men out on their crutches come to see us hold our way and the old men out on their crutches come to bless us on our way around us in rear and flanks their futile squadrons play with a sixty-mile front of steady ranks we hold our checkless way with a sixty-mile front of serried ranks our banner clears the way hear the spattering fire that starts from the woods and the corpses gray there is just enough fighting to quicken our hearts as we frolic along the way there is just enough fighting to warm our hearts as we rattle along the way upon different roads abreast the heads of our columns gay with fluttering flags all forward pressed hold on their conquering way with fluttering flags to victory pressed we hold our glorious way ah traitors who bragged so bold in the sad war's early day did nothing predict you should ever behold the old flag come this way did nothing predict you should yet behold our banner come back this way by heaven tis a gala march tis a picnic or a play of all our long war tis the crowning arch hip hip for sherman's way of all our long war this crowns the arch for sherman and grant hooray charles graham halpine marching through georgia bring the good old bugle boys we'll sing another song sing it with a spirit that will start the world along sing it as we used to sing it fifty thousand strong while we were marching through georgia hurrah hurrah we bring the jubilee hurrah hurrah the flag that makes you free so we sang the chorus from atlanta to the sea while we were marching through georgia how the darkies shouted when they heard the joyful sound how the turkeys gobbled which our commissary found how the sweet potatoes even started from the ground while we were marching through georgia yes and there were union men who wept with joyful tears when they saw the honored flag they had not seen for years hardly could they be restrained from breaking forth in cheers while we were marching through georgia hurrah hurrah we bring the jubilee hurrah hurrah the flag that makes you free so we sang the chorus from atlanta to the sea while we were marching through georgia sherman's dashing yankee boys will never reach the coast so the saucy rebels said and twas a handsome boast had they not forgot alas to reckon on a host while we were marching through georgia so we made a thoroughfare for freedom and her train sixty miles in latitude three hundred to the main treason fled before us for resistance was in vain while we were marching through georgia hurrah hurrah we bring the jubilee hurrah hurrah the flag that makes you free so we sang the chorus from atlanta to the sea while we were marching through georgia henry clay work ethiopia saluting the colors who are you dusky woman so ancient hardly human with your woolly white and turbaned head and bare bony feet 
why rising by the roadside here do you the colors greet tis while our army lines carolinas sands and pines forth from thy hovel door thou ethiopia comes to me as under doughty sherman i march toward the sea me master's years a hundred since from my parents sundered a little child they caught me as the savage beast is caught then hither me across the sea the cruel slaver brought no further does she say but lingering all the day her high-born turbaned head she wags and rolls her darkling eye and curtsies to the regiments the guidons moving by what is it fateful woman so blear hardly human why wag your head with turban bound yellow red and green are the things so strange and marvellous you see or have seen walt whitman the invasion brought panic to the south, and Beauregard hastened to oppose it. But Sherman pressed on irresistibly, beating down all opposition, reached Savannah, and on December 22, 1864, marched into the city which had been abandoned by the Confederates. On Christmas Day, he telegraphed President Lincoln, I beg to present to you as a Christmas gift the city of Savannah. Sherman's in Savannah, December 22, 1864. Like the tribes of Israel fed on quails and manna, Sherman and his glorious band journeyed through the rebel land, fed from heaven's all bounteous hand, marching on Savannah. As the moving pillar shone, streamed the starry banner. All day long in rosy light, flaming splendor all the night, till it swooped in eagle flight down on doomed savannah glory be to god on high shout the loud hosanna treason's wilderness is past canaan's shore is won at last peal a nation's trumpet blast sherman's in savannah soon shall richmond's tough old hide find a tough old tanner soon from every rebel wall shall the rag of treason fall till our banner flaps over all, as it crowns Savannah. Oliver Wendell Holmes Savannah, December twenty third, 1864 Thou hast not drooped thy stately head, Thy woes a wondrous beauty shed, Not like a lamb to slaughter led, But with the lion's monarch tread. Thou comest to thy battle bed, Savannah, O oh, Savannah. Thine arm of flesh is girded strong, the blue veins swell beneath thy wrong. To thee the triple cords belong, of woe and death and shameless wrong, and spirit vaunted long, too long, Savannah, O oh, Savannah. No bloodstains spot thy forehead fair. Only the martyr's blood is there. It gleams upon thy bosom bare. It moves thy deep, deep soul to prayer and tunes a dirge for thy sad ear. Savannah, oh, Savannah. Thy clean white hand is opened wide. For weal or woe, thou freedom bride. The sword sheath sparkles at thy side. Thy plighted troth, whatever be tied. Thou hast but freedom for thy guide. Savannah, O oh, Savannah! What though the heavy storm cloud lowers, Still at thy feet the old oak towers, Still fragrant are thy jessamine bowers, And things of beauty, love, and flowers Are smiling over this land of ours, My sunny home, Savannah. There is no film before thy sight, Thou seest woe and death and night, and blood upon thy banner bright. But in thy full wrath's kindled might, Who carest thou for woe or night? My rebel home, Savannah. Come, for the crown is on thy head, Thy woes a wondrous beauty shed, Not like a lamb to slaughter led, But with the lion's monarch tread. O oh, come unto thy battle bed, Savannah, O oh, Savannah. Alethea Esparos 
Sherman paused at Savannah to fortify the place and get his army into shape. After its march of 250 miles, then on January 15, 1865, he started northward into South Carolina. Carolina, January 1865 The despot treads thy sacred sands. Thy pines give shelter to his bands. Thy sons stand by with idle hands. Carolina. He breathes at ease thy airs of balm. He scorns the lances of thy palm. Oh, who shall break thy craven calm? Carolina. Thy ancient fame is growing dim. A spot is on thy garment's rim. Give to the winds thy battle hymn. Carolina. Call on thy children of the hill. Wake swamp and river, coast and rill. Rouse all thy strength and all thy skill. Carolina. Sight wealth and science, trade and art. Touch with thy fire the cautious mart. And pour thee through the people's heart. Carolina. Till even the coward spurns his fears. And all thy fields and fens and mears. Shall bristle like thy palm with spears. Carolina. I hear a murmur as of waves that grope their way through sunless caves, like bodies struggling in their graves. Carolina. And now it deepens, slow and grand, it swells as rolling to the land, an ocean broke upon thy strand. Carolina. Shout, let it reach the startled Huns, and roar with all thy festal guns. It is the answer of thy sons. Carolina. Henry Timrod. Every man in the state was called to arms, but the Union forces met with only a weak and ineffective resistance. On February 16, 1865, Columbia was occupied, and catching fire accidentally next day, was totally destroyed. The fall of Columbia left Charleston exposed, and the Confederate troops hastened to get away while they could. Charleston, February 1865 Calmly beside her tropic strand, an empress, brave and loyal. I see the watchful city stand, with aspect sternly royal. She knows her mortal foe draws near, armored by subtlest science. Yet deep, majestical, and clear, rings out her grand defiance. O oh, glorious is thy noble face, lit up by proud emotion, and unsurpassed thy stately grace, our warrior, queen of ocean. First from thy lips the summons came, which roused our south to action, and with the quenchless force of flame consumed the demon faction. First, like a rush of sovereign wind that rends dull waves asunder, thy prescient warning struck the blind and woke the deaf with thunder. They saw with swiftly kindling eyes the shameful doom before them, and heard, born wild from northern skies, the death gale hurtling o'er them. Wilt thou, whose virgin banner rose, a morning star of splendor, quail when the war tornado blows, and crouch in base surrender? Wilt thou, upon whose loving breast our noblest chiefs are sleeping, yield thy dead patriot's place of rest to scornful alien keeping? No, while a life pulse throbs for fame, thy sons will gather round thee. Welcome the shot, the steel, the flame, if honor's hand hath crowned thee. Then fold about thy beauteous form, the imperial robe thou wearest, and front with regal port the storm, thy foe would dream thou fairest. If strength and will and courage fail to cope with ruthless numbers, and thou must bend, despairing, pale, where thy last hero slumbers. Lift the red torch and light the fire amid those corpses gory, and on thy self-made funeral pyre pass from the world to glory. Paul Hamilton Hayne The cotton in the town was burned. Many houses caught fire, and a magazine exploded, killing two hundred people. The city was virtually a ruin when the last of the Confederate troops, 
poor old Dixie's bottom dollar, left the city. Romance. Talk of pluck, pursued the sailor, said at Euchre on his elbow. I was on the wharf at Charleston, just ashore from off the runner. It was gray and dirty weather, and I heard a drum go rolling, rub-a-dubbing in the distance, awful dour-like and defiant. In and out among the cotton, mud and chains and stores and anchors tramped a squad of battered scarecrows, poor old Dixie's bottom dollar. Some had shoes, but all had rifles. Them that wasn't bald was beardless. And the drum was rolling Dixie, and they stepped to it like men, sir. Rags and tatters, belts and bayonets, on they swung, the drum a-rolling, mum and sour. It looked like fighting, and they meant it too by thunder. William Ernest Henley The excitement of the people mounted to hysteria. There were those who advised that the city be destroyed, and that its inhabitants die fighting on its ashes. But calmer counsel prevailed, and Charleston, on February 18, 1865, was surrendered without resistance. The Foe at the Gates, Charleston, 1865 Ring round her, children of her glorious skies, whom she hath nursed to stature proud and great. Catch one last glance from her imploring eyes, then close your ranks and face the threatening fate. Ring round her, with a wall of horrent steel, confront the foe, nor mercy ask nor give, and in her hour of anguish let her feel that ye can die whom she has taught to live. Ring round her, swear by every lifted blade, to shield from wrong the mother who gave you birth, that never violent hand on her be laid, nor base foot desecrate her hollowed hearth. Cursed be the dastard who shall halt or doubt, and doubly damned who casts one look behind. Ye who are men with unsheathed sword and shout, up with her banner, give it to the wind. Peel your wild slogan, echoing far and wide, Till every ringing avenue repeat The gathering cry and Ashley's angry tide Calls to the sea waves beating round her feet. Sons to the rescue, spurred and belted, come. Kneeling with clasped hands, she invokes you now by the sweet memories of your childhood's home, by every manly hope and filial vow, to save her proud soul from that loathed thrall, which yet her spirit cannot brook to name, or if her fate be near and she must fall, spare her, she sues, the agony and shame. From all her fanes, let solemn bells be tolled. Heap with kind hands her costly funeral pyre, and thus, with paean sung and anthem rolled, give her unspotted to the god of fire. Gather around her, sacred ashes then. Sprinkle the cherished dust with crimson rain, die as becomes a race of free-born men who will not crouch to wear the bondman's chain. So dying, ye shall win a high renown, if not in life, at least by death set free, and send her fame through endless ages down, the last grand holocaust of liberty. John Dixon Bruns While Sherman was accomplishing his task in this triumphant manner, Grant was hammering away at Richmond. Late in February 1864, a strong force under Kilpatrick was detached to raid around Richmond and, if possible, release the Union prisoners at Belle Isle and in Libby Prison. 
They reached the outer fortifications, but were repulsed, Major Ulrich Dahlgren being among the killed. Ulrich Dahlgren, March 2, 1864 A flash of light across the night, an eager face, an eye afire. O oh, lad, so true, you yet may rue the courage of your deep desire. Nay, tempt me not, the way is plain. Tis but the coward checks his reign. For there they lie, and there they cry, For whose dear sake twere joy to die. He bends into his saddle-bow, The steeds they follow, two and two. Their flanks are wet with foam and sweat, Their riders' locks are damp with dew. O oh, comrades, haste! The way is long, the dirge it drowns the battle song, the hunger preys, the famine slays, an awful horror veils our ways. Beneath the pall of prison wall, the rush of hoofs they seem to hear, from loathsome guise they lift their eyes and beat their bars and bend their ear. Ah, God be thanked, our friends are nigh, He wills it not that thus we die. Our friends are cursed of want and thirst. Our comrades gather, do your worst. A sharp affright runs through the night, an ambush stirred, a column reigned. The hurrying steed has checked his speed, his smoking flanks are crimson stained. O noble son of noble sire, thine ears are deaf to our desire. O knightly grace of valiant race, the grave is honor's trysting place. O life so pure, O faith so sure, O heart so brave and true and strong, With tips of flame is writ your name, In annaled deed and storied song. It flares across the solemn night, It glitters in the radiant light, A jewel set, unnumbered yet, In our republic's coronet. Kate Brownlee Sherwood On May 1, 1864, a general advance was ordered, and two days later the Army of the Potomac, 130,000 strong, advanced into the wilderness, south of the Rapidan. There, on May 5th, Lee hurled his forces upon them. On the second day, Lee seized the colors of a Texas regiment and started to lead an assault in person. The men remonstrated and promised to carry the position if Lee would retire. The troops advanced, shouting, Lee to the rear, and kept their word. Lee to the rear, May 6, 1864 Dawn of a pleasant morning in May Broke through the wilderness, cool and gray, While perched in the tallest tree-tops the birds Were caroling Mendelssohn's songs without words. Far from the haunts of men remote, The brook brawled on with a liquid note, and nature, all tranquil and lovely, wore the smile of the spring as an Eden of yore. Little by little as daylight increased, and deepened the roseate flush in the east, little by little did morning reveal two long glittering lines of steel, where two hundred thousand bayonets gleam, tipped with the light of the earliest beam, and the faces are sullen and grim to see, in the hostile armies of Grant and Lee. All of a sudden, ere rose the sun, Peeled on the silence the opening gun, A little white puff of smoke there came, And anon the valley was wreathed in flame. Down on the left of the rebel lines, Where a breastwork stands in a copse of pines, Before the rebels their ranks can form, The Yankees have carried the place by storm, Stars and stripes on the salient wave, Where many a hero has found a grave, And the gallant confederates strive in vain, The ground they have drenched with their blood to regain. Yet louder the thunder of battle roared, Yet a deadlier fire on the columns poured, Slaughter infernal rode with despair, Furies twain through the murky air, Not far off in the saddle there sat, a gray-bearded man in a black slouched hat. Not much moved by the fire was he, calm and resolute, Robert Lee. Quick and watchful he kept his eye on the bold rebel brigades close by, reserves that were standing and dying at ease while the tempest of wrath toppled over the trees. 
for still with their loud deep bulldog bay the yankee batteries blazed away and with every murderous second that sped a dozen brave fellows alas fell dead the grand old greybeard rode to the space where death and his victims stood face to face and silently waved his old slouched hat a world of meaning there was in that follow me steady we'll save the day this was what he seemed to say and to the light of his glorious eye the bold brigades thus made reply we'll go forward but you must go back and they moved not an inch in the perilous track go to the rear and we'll send them to hell and the sound of the battle was lost in their yell turning his bridle robert lee rode to the rear like waves of the sea bursting the dikes in their overflow madly his veterans dashed on the foe and backward in terror that foe was driven their banners rent and their columns riven wherever the tide of battle rolled over the wilderness wood and wold sunset out of a crimson sky streamed over a field of ruddier dye and the brook ran on with a purple stain from the blood of ten thousand foemen slain seasons have passed since that day and year again over its pebbles the brook runs clear and the field in a richer green is dressed where the dead of a terrible conflict rest hushed is the roll of the rebel drum the sabres are sheathed and the cannon are dumb and fate with his pitiless hand has furled the flag that once challenged the gaze of the world but the fame of the wilderness fight abides and down into history grandly rides calm and unmoved as in battle he sat the gray bearded man in the black slouched hat john randolph thompson for two weeks a frightful struggle raged the union losses were fearful but on may eleventh eighteen sixty four grant wired to the secretary of war i propose to fight it out on this line if it takes all summer can't how history repeats itself you'll say when you remember grant who in his boyhood days once sought throughout the lexicon for can't he could not find the word that day the earnest boy whose name was grant he never found it through long years with all their powers to disenchant no hostile host could give him pause rivers and mountains could not daunt he never found that hindering word the steadfast man whose name was grant harriet prescott spofford grant used his cavalry most effectively and he had a dashing leader in phil sheridan early in may eighteen sixty four sheridan and a strong force was sent on a raid around the confederate lines and on the twelfth encountered general j e b stuart in force at yellow tavern a sharp engagement followed in which stuart was killed obsequies of stuart may twelfth eighteen sixty four we could not pause while yet the noontide air shook with the cannonade's incessant pealing the funeral pageant fitly to prepare a nation's grief revealing the smoke above the glimmering woodland wide that skirts our southward border in its beauty marked where our heroes stood and fought and died for love and faith and duty and still what time the doubtful strife went on we might not find expression for our sorrow we could but lay our dear dumb warrior down and gird us for the morrow one weary year agone when came a lull with victory in the conflict's stormy closes when the glad spring all flushed and beautiful first mocked us with her roses with dirge and bell and minute gun we paid some few poor rites an inexpressive token of a great people's pain to jackson's shade in agony unspoken 
no wailing trumpet and no tolling bell no cannon save the battle's boom receding when stuart to the grave we bore might tell with hearts all crushed and bleeding the crisis suited not with pomp and she whose anguish bears the seal of consecration had wished his christian obsequies should be thus void of ostentation only the maidens came sweet flowers to twine above his form so still and cold and painless whose deeds upon our brightest records shine whose life and sword were stainless they well remembered how he loved to dash into the fight festooned from summer bowers how like a fountain's spray his sabres flash leaped from a mass of flowers and so he carried to his place of rest all that of our great paladin was mortal the cross and not the sabre on his breast that opes the heavenly portal no more of tribute might to us remain but there will still come a time when freedom's martyrs a richer guerdon of renown shall gain than gleams in stars and garters i hear from out that sunlit land which lies beyond these clouds that gather darkly over us the happy sounds of industry arise in swelling peaceful chorus and mingling with these sounds the glad acclaim of millions undisturbed by war's afflictions crowning each martyr's never dying name with grateful benedictions in some fair future garden of delights where flowers shall bloom and songbirds sweetly warble art shall erect the statues of our knights in living bronze and marble and none of all that bright heroic throng shall wear to far-off time a semblance grander shall still be decked with fresher wreaths of song than this beloved commander the spanish legend tells us of the cid that after death he rode erect sedately along his lines even as in life he did in presence yet more stately and thus our stuart at this moment seems to ride out of our dark and troubled story into the region of romance and dreams a realm of light and glory and sometimes when the silver bugles blow that ghostly form in battle reappearing shall lead his horsemen headlong on the foe in victory careering john randolph thompson grant was overwhelming the confederates by weight of numbers and pushed slowly on to divert him lee threw a portion of his army into the shenandoah valley and started again to invade maryland and pennsylvania a body of troops contested their passage at snicker's ferry and a sharp skirmish followed a christopher of the shenandoah island ford snicker's gap july eighteen eighteen sixty four told by the orderly mute he sat in the saddle mute midst our full acclaim as three times over we gave to the mountain echo his name then but i couldn't do less in a murmur remonstrate came this was the deed his spirit set and his hand would not shun when the veil of the shenandoah had lost the glow of the sun and the evening cloud and the battle smoke were blending in one retreating and ever retreating the bank of the river we gained hope of the field was none and choice but of flight remained when there at the brink of the ford his horse he suddenly reined for his vigilant eye had marked where close by the oozy marge half parted its moorings there lay a battered and oarless barge quick gather the wounded in and the flying stayed at his charge they gathered the wounded in whence they fell by the river bank lapped on the gleaming sand or a swoon mid the rushes dank and they crowded the barge till its sides low down and the water sank 
The river was wide, was deep, and heady the current flowed. A burdened and oarless craft, straight into the stream he rode, by the side of the barge, and drew it along with its moaning load. A moaning and ghastly load, the wounded, the dying, the dead, for ever upon their traces followed the whistling lead. Our bravest, the mark, yet unscathed and undaunted, he pushed ahead. Alone, save for one that from love of his leader or soldierly pride, hearing his call for aid and seeing that none replied, plunged and swam by the crazy craft on the other side. But heaven, what weary toil, for the river is wide, is deep, the current is swift, and the bank on the further side is steep. Tis reached at last, and a hundred of ours to the rescue leap. Oh, they cheered as he rose from the stream, and the water drops flowed away. But I couldn't do less, in the silence that followed, we heard him say. Then the wounded cheered, and the swooning awoke in the barge where they lay. And I, ah, well, I swam by the barge on the other side, but an orderly goes wherever his leader chooses to ride. Come life or come death, I couldn't do less than follow his guide. Edith M. Thomas The Confederate cavalry pushed on toward the Susquehanna, sacked Chambersburg, and filled all western Pennsylvania with panic. Grant at once got together a large force to repel this invasion and placed it under command of General Sheridan. On September 19, 1864, the Confederates attacked his troops at Winchester, but Sheridan beat them off and punished them so severely that he supposed they had enough. With that impression, he went to Washington on official business, leaving his men strongly posted on Cedar Creek. There, on the morning of October 19, the Confederates attacked them, front, flank, and rear. Sheridan at Cedar Creek October 19, 1864 Shoe the steed with silver that bore him to the fray. When he heard the guns at dawning miles away, when he heard them calling, calling, Mount nor stay, quick or all is lost. They've surprised and stormed the post. They pushed your routed host. Gallop, retrieve the day. How's the horse? An ermine, for the foam flake blew. White through the red October, he thundered into view. They cheered him in the looming, horseman and horse they knew. The turn of the tide began, the rally of bugles ran. He swung his hat in the van, the electric hoof spark flew. Wreath the steed and lead him, for the charge he led touched and turned the cypress into amaranths for the head of philip king of riders who raised them from the dead the camp at dawning lost by eve recovered forced rang with laughter of the host as belated early fled shroud the horse in sable for the mounds they heap there is firing in the valley and yet no strife they keep it is the parting volley, it is the pathos deep. There is glory for the brave who led and nobly save, but no knowledge in the grave where the nameless followers sleep. Herman Melville Sheridan, returning from Washington, had slept at Winchester the night of October 18, 1864, and early next morning heard the sounds of the battle. He mounted his horse and started for the field, reached there just in time to rally his retreating troops, turned a defeat into a decisive victory, and drove the invaders pell-mell back to Virginia. Sheridan's Ride, October 19, 1864 Up from the south at break of day, bringing to Winchester fresh dismay, the affrighted air with a shudder bore, like a herald in haste to the chieftain's door, the terrible grumble and rumble and roar, telling the battle was on once more, and Sheridan twenty miles away. And wider still those billows of war, 
thundered along the horizon's bar and louder yet into winchester rolled the roar of that red sea uncontrolled making the blood of the listener cold as he thought of the stake in that fiery fray with sheridan twenty miles away but there is a road from winchester town a good broad highway leading down and there through the flush of the morning light a steed as black as the steeds of night was seen to pass as with eagle flight as if he knew the terrible need he stretched away with his utmost speed hills rose and fell but his heart was gay with sheridan fifteen miles away still sprang from those swift hoofs thundering south the dust like smoke from the cannon's mouth or the trail of a comet sweeping faster and faster foreboding to traitors the doom of disaster the heart of the steed and the heart of the master were beating like prisoners assaulting their walls impatient to be where the battlefield calls every nerve of the charger was strained to full play with sheridan only ten miles away under his spurning feet the road like an arrowy alpine river flowed and the landscape sped away behind like an ocean flying before the wind as the steed like a bark fed with furnace ire swept on with his wild eye full of fire but lo he is nearing his heart's desire he is snuffing the smoke of the roaring fray with Sheridan only five miles away. The first that the general saw were the groups of stragglers, and then the retreating troops. What was done? What to do? A glance told him both. Then striking his spurs with a terrible oath, he dashed down the line mid a storm of huzzas, and the wave of retreat checked its course there because the sight of the master compelled it to pause, with foam and with dust, the black charger was gray by the flash of his eye and the red nostrils play. He seemed to the whole great army to say, I have brought you Sheridan all the way from Winchester down to save the day. Hurrah, hurrah for Sheridan, hurrah, hurrah for horse and man. And when their statues are placed on high under the dome of the Union sky, the American soldier's temple of fame, there with the glorious general's name, be it said in letters both bold and bright, here is the steed that saved the day by carrying Sheridan into the fight from Winchester twenty miles away. Thomas Buchanan Reed Grant, meanwhile, steadily tightened his grip on Richmond, and Lee at last perceived that to hold the capital longer would be to sacrifice his army. He withdrew during the night of April 2nd, 1865, and the Union troops entered the city unopposed the next day. The Year of Jubilee, sung by the Negro troops as they entered Richmond. Say, darkies, have you seen the massa with the mustache on his face? He go along the road some time this morning, like he couldn't leave the place. He see the smoke way up the river, where the Lincoln gunboats lay. He take a hat awfully very sudden, and I suppose he'd run away. The master run, ha ha, the darky stay, ho ho. It must be now the kingdom coming and the year of jubilo. He's six foot one way and two foot totter, and he weighs six hundred pound. His coat so big he couldn't pay the tailor, and it won't reach halfway round. He drills so much they call him cap'n, and he gets so mighty tanned. He speck he'll try to fool them Yankees for de tinky contraband. De master run, ha ha, de darky stay, ho ho, it must be now de kingdom coming and de yar of jubilo. De darky's got so lonesome living, and de log hut in de lawn. De move dead tings into master's parlor for to keep it while he gone. Dar's wine in de cider in de kitchen, and de dark as they have some, I speck it will be all fiscated when de Lincoln soldiers come. De massa run, ha ha, de darky stay, ho ho, it must be now de kingdom coming in de yar of jubilo. De observer he make us trouble, and he drive us round in spell. We lock him up in de smoke house cellar with de king flung in de well. 
and de whip him lost a hank of broke but de massy happy's pay he big and old enough for to know better den wind and run away de master run ha ha de darky stay ho ho it must be now de kingdom comin on de year o jubilo henry clay work virginia capta april eighteen sixty five unconquered captive close thine eye and draw the ashen sackcloth over and in thy speechless woe deplore the fate that would not let thee die the arm that wore the shield strip bare the hand that held the martial rein and hurled the spear on many a plain stretch till they clasp the shackles there the foot that once could crush the crown must drag the fetters till it bleed beneath their weight thou dost not need it now to tread the tyrant down thou thost him vanquished boastful trust his lance in twain his sword a wreck but with his heel upon thy neck he holds thee prostrate in the dust bend though thou must beneath his will let not one abject moan have place but with majestic silent grace maintain thy regal bearing still look back through all thy storied past and sit erect in conscious pride no grander heroes ever died no sterner battled to the last weep if thou wilt with proud sad mien thy blasted hopes thy peace undone yet brave live on nor seek to shun thy fate like egypt's conquered queen though forced a captive's place to fill in the triumphal train yet there superbly like zenobia wear thy chains virginia victrix still margaret junkin preston tidings of the fall of richmond went over the north with lightning speed and in every city every town and hamlet public demonstrations were held the fall of richmond the tidings received in the northern metropolis april eighteen sixty five what mean these peals from every tower and crowds like seas that sway the cannon reply they speak the heart of the people impassioned and say a city in flags for a city in flames richmond goes babylon's way sing and pray o oh, weary years and woeful wars and armies in the grave but hearts unquelled at last deter the helmed dilated lucifer honor to grant the brave whose three stars now like orion's rise when wreck is on the wave bless his glaive well that the faith we firmly kept and never our aim forswore for the terrors that trooped from each recess when fainting we fought in the wilderness and hell made loud hurrah but god is in heaven and grant in the town and right through might is law god's way adore herman melville lee meanwhile was trying desperately to escape the force which grant had sent in pursuit of him his army was dreadfully shattered and without supplies his horses were too weak to draw the cannon and he soon found himself surrounded by a vastly superior force to fight would have been folly instead he sent forward a white flag and surrendered at two o'clock on the afternoon of palm sunday april nine eighteen sixty five the surrender at appomattox april nine eighteen sixty five as billows upon billows roll on victory victory breaks ere yet seven days from richmond's fall and crowning triumph wakes the loud joy gun whose thunders run by seashore streams and lakes the hope and great event agree in the sword that grant received from lee the warring eagles fold the wing but not in caesar's sway not rome overcome by roman arms we sing as on for sally his day but treason thrown through a giant groan and freedom's larger play 
all human tribes glad token see in the close of the wars of grant and lee herman melville grant was generous with the fallen enemy too generous some of the patriot politicians thought in releasing lee and his officers on parole but grant insisted that the terms he had given be carried out to the letter lee's parole well general grant have you heard the news how the orders are issued and ready to send for lee and the men in his staff command to be under arrest now the war's at an end how so arrested for what he cried oh for trial as traitors to be shot or hung the chief's eyes flashed with a sudden ire and his face grew crimson as up he sprung orderly fetch me my horse he said then into the saddle and up the street as if the battle were raging ahead went the crash of the old war charger's feet what is this i am told about lee's arrest is it true and the keen eyes searched his soul it is true and the order will be enforced my word was given in their parole at richmond and that parole has not been broken nor has my word nor will be until there is better cause for a breaking than this i have lately heard do you know sir whom you have thus addressed i am the war department's head and i am general grant at your peril order arrests he said a friend is a friend as we reckon worth who will throw the gauntlet in friendship's fight but a man is a man in peace or war who will stake his all for an enemy's right "'Twas a hard-fought battle, but quickly won, "'as a fight must be when tis soul to soul. "'And twas years ago, but that honored word "'preserved the North in the South's parole. "'Marion Manville "'In disbanding his army, "'Lee issued a farewell address, "'copies of which are still treasured in many a Southern home. Even in the North he has come to be recognized as the great general and true gentleman he really was. Robert E. Lee A gallant foeman in the fight, a brother when the fight was o'er, the hand that led the host with might, the blessed torch of learning bore, no shriek of shields nor roll of drums, no challenge fierce resounding far when reconciling wisdom comes to heal the cruel wounds of war thought may the minds of men divide love makes the heart of nations one and so thy soldier grave beside we honor thee virginia's son julia ward howe end of section ten Chapter 11 of Poems of American History, Volume 4, The Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Poems of American History, Volume 4, The Civil War by Various. Chapter 11, Winslow and Farragut. During the Civil War, the Confederates commissioned a large number of privateers to prey upon northern commerce the most famous of which was the Alabama, commanded by Raphael Semmes. Semmes had ordered to sink, burn, and destroy everything flying the stars and stripes, and carried them out in the most thorough-going way. On June 11, 1864, the Alabama entered the harbor of Cherbourg, France. Three days later, the United States sloop of war Kearsarge, Captain John A. Winslow, appeared in the offing, and both ships prepared for battle. The Alabama steamed out of the harbor on the morning of Sunday, June 19th, and was soon reduced to a wreck by the deadly fire from the Kearsage. She sank while trying to run inshore. The Eagle and Vulture, June 1864 In Cherbourg Roads the pirate lay, one morn in June, like a beast at bay, feeling secure in the neutral port, under the guns of the Frenchman's fort. A thieving vulture, a coward thing, sheltered beneath a despot's wing. 
but there outside in the calm blue bay our ocean eagle the cure surge lay lay at her ease on the sunday morn holding the corsair ship in scorn with captain and crew in the might of their right willing to pray but more eager to fight four bells are struck and this thing of night like a panther crouching with fierce affright must leap from his cover and come what may must fight for his life or steal away so out of the port with his braggart air with flaunting flags sailed the proud corsair the sherberg cliffs were all alive with lookers-on like a swarming hive while compelled to do what he dared not shirk the pirate went to his desperate work and europe's tyrants looked on in glee as they thought of our cure-surge sunk in the sea but our little bark smiled back at them a smile of contempt with that union gem the american banner far floating and free proclaiming her champions were out on the sea were out on the sea and abroad on the land determined to win under god's command down came the vulture our eagle sat still waiting to strike with her iron-clad bill convinced by the glow of his glorious cause he could crumple his foe in the grasp of his claws clear the decks then said winslow words measured and slow point the guns and prepare for the terrible blow and whatever the fate to ourselves may be we will sink in the ocean this pest of the sea the decks were all cleared and the guns were all manned awaiting to meet this atlantic brigand when lo roared a broadside the ship of the thief was torn and wept blood in that moment of grief another 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 and still the broadsides went in with a hearty good will till the pirate reeled wildly as staggering and drunk and down to his own native regions he sunk down down forty fathoms beneath the blue wave and the hopes of old europe lie in the same grave while freedom more firm stands upon her own sod and for heroes like winslow is shouting thank god thomas buchanan reed cure surge and alabama june nineteenth eighteen sixty four it was early sunday morning in the year of sixty four the alabama she steamed out along the frenchman's shore long time she cruised about long time she held her sway but now beneath the frenchman's shore she lies off cherbourg bay hoist up the flag and long may it wave over the union the home of the brave hoist up the flag and long may it wave god bless america the home of the brave the yankee cruiser hove in view the kearsarge was her name it ought to be engraved in full upon the scroll of fame her timbers made of yankee oak and her crew of yankee tars and o'er her mizzen peak she floats the glorious stripes and stars a challenge unto captain semmes bold winslow he did send bring on your alabama and to her we will attend for we think your boasting privateer is not so hard to whip and we'll show you that the kearsarge is not a merchant's ship it was early sunday morning in the year of sixty four the alabama she stood out and cannons loud did roar the kearsarge stood undaunted and quickly she replied and let a yankee eleven inch shell go tearing through her side the kearsarge then she wore around and broadside on did bear with shot and shell in right good will her timbers she did tear when they found that they were sinking down came the stars and bars for the rebel gunners could not stand the glorious stripes and stars the alabama she is gone she'll cruise the seas no more she met the fate she well deserved along the frenchman's shore then here is luck to the kearsarge we know what she can do likewise to captain winslow and his brave and gallant crew hoist up the flag and long may it wave over the union the home of the brave hoist up the flag and long may it wave god bless america the home of the brave kearsarge june nineteenth eighteen sixty four sunday in old england in gray churches everywhere the calm of low responses the sacred hush of prayer sunday in old england and summer winds that went o'er the pleasant fields of sussex the garden lands of kent stole into dim church windows and passed the oaken door and fluttered open prayer books with the cannon's awful roar 
sunday in new england upon a mountain gray the wind-bent pines are swaying like giants at their play across the barren lowlands where men find scanty food the north wind brings its vigor to homesteads plain and rude ho land of pine and granite ho hardy northland breeze will have you trained the manhood that shook the channel seas when o'er those storied waters the iron war bolts flew and through old england's churches the summer breezes blew while in our other england stirred one gaunt rocky steep when rode her sons as victors lords of the lonely deep s weir mitchell london july twentieth eighteen sixty four the alabama she has gone to the bottom the wrath of the tide now breaks in vain insolence o'er her no more the rough seas like a queen shall she ride while the foe flies in terror before her now captive or exiled or silent in death the forms that so bravely did man her her deck is untrod and the gale's stirring breath flouts no more the red cross of her banner she is down neath the waters but still her bright name is in death as in life ever glorious and a sceptre all barren the conqueror must claim though he boasts the proud title victorious her country's lone champion she shuns not the fight though unequal in strength bold and fearless and proved in her fate though not matchless in might in daring at least she was peerless no trophy hung high in the foe's hated hall shall speak of her final disaster nor tell of the danger that could not appall nor the spirit that nothing could master the death shot has sped she has grimly gone down but left her destroyer no token and the mythical wand of her mystic renown though the waters o'erwhelm is unbroken for lo ere she settles beneath the dark wave on her enemy's cheeks spreads a pallor as another deck summons the swords of the brave to gild a new name with their valor her phantom will yet haunt the wild roaring breeze causing foemen to start and to shudder while their commerce still steals like a thief o'er the seas and trembles from bow spirit to rudder the spirit that shed on the wave's gleaming crest the light of a legend romantic shall live while a sail flutters over the breast of thy far bounding billows atlantic and as long as one swift keel the strong surges stems one poor jack loves his song and story shall shine in tradition the valor of sems and the brave ship that bore him to glory maurice bell mobile and wilmington were the only important confederate ports still open and early in august eighteen sixty four admiral farragut appeared off mobile with a fleet of eighteen vessels the entrance to the harbor was strongly defended by forts on both sides but farragut determined to run past them on august fifth the fleet advanced but the tecumseh leading the fleet struck a torpedo and sank instantly carrying down nearly all her crew including t a m craven her commander who drew aside from the latter that the pilot might pass first craven august fifth eighteen sixty four over the turret shut in his iron-clad tower craven was conning his ship through smoke and flame gun to gun he had battered the fort for an hour now was the time for a charge to end the game there lay the narrowing channel smooth and grim a hundred deaths beneath it and never a sign there lay the enemy's sh ships and sink or swim the flag was flying and he was head of the line the fleet behind was jamming the monitor hung beating the stream the roar for a moment hushed craven spoke to the pilot slow she swung again he spoke and right for the foe she rushed into the narrowing channel between the shore and the sunk torpedoes lying in treacherous rank she turned but a yard too short a muffled roar a mountainous wave and she rolled righted and sank over the manhole up in the ironclad tower pilot and captain met as they turned to fly the hundredth part of a moment seemed an hour for one could pass to be saved and one must die they stood like men in a dream craven spoke spoke as he lived and fought with a captain's pride after you pilot the pilot woke down the ladder he went and craven died all men praised the deed and the manner but we 
we set it apart from the pride that stoops to the proud the strength that is supple to serve the strong and free the grace of the empty hands and promises loud sydney thirsting a humbler need to slake nelson waiting his turn for the surgeon's hand lucas crushed with the chains for a comrade's sake outrim coveting right before command these were paladins these were craven's peers these with him shall be crowned in story and song crowned with the glitter of steel and the glimmer of tears princes of courtesy merciful proud and strong henry newbolt farragut who had lashed himself to the shrouds of his flagship the hartford observed the brooklyn which preceded him recoil as the tecumseh sank what's the trouble he signaled torpedoes answered the brooklyn damn the torpedoes shouted farragut go ahead captain drayton four bells and the hartford cleared the brooklyn and took the lead farragut mobile bay august fifth eighteen sixty four farragut farragut old heart of oak daring dave farragut thunderbolt stroke watches the hoary mist lift from the bay till his flag glory kissed greets the young day far by gray morgan's walls looms the black fleet hark deck to rampart calls with the drums beat buoy your chains overboard while the steam hums men to the battlement farragut comes see as the hurricane hurtles in wrath squadrons of clouds amain back from its path back to the parapet to the gun's lips thunderbolt farragut hurls the black ships now through the battle's roar clear the boy sings by the marks fathoms four while his lead swings steady the wheelman five nor by east keep her steady but too alive how the shells sweep her lashed to the mast that sways over red decks over the flame that plays round the torn wrecks over the dying lips framed for a cheer farragut leads his ships guides the line clear on by heights cannon browed while the spars quiver onward still flames the cloud where the hulks shiver see yon fort's star is set storm and fire past cheer him lads farragut lashed to the mast oh while atlantic's breast bears a white sail while the gulf's towering crest tops a green veil men thy bold deeds shall tell old heart of oak daring dave farragut thunderbolt stroke william tucky meredith on went the flagship across the line of torpedoes but not one of them exploded and a moment later one of the most daring feats in the naval history of the world had been safely accomplished the line of battle was reformed the forts and confederate fleet savagely attacked and by nine o'clock the union fleet was in the bay through fire in mobile bay august fifth eighteen sixty four I'd weave a wreath for those who fought in blue upon the waves. I drop a tear for all who sleep down in the coral caves. And proudly do I touch my cap when e'er I meet today a man who sailed with Farragut through fire in Mobile Bay. Oh, what a gallant sight it was as toward the foe we bore. Lashed to the mast, unflinching stood our grand old Commodore. I see him now above the deck, though time is cleared away. The battle smoke that densely hung above old mobile bay torpedoes to the right and left torpedoes straight ahead the staunch tecumseh sinks from sight the waves receive her dead but we press on through lead and iron on on with pennons gay whilst glory holds her wreath above immortal mobile bay the rebel forts belch fire and death but what care we for them our onward course with Farragut to guide us not can stem. The Hartford works her dreaded guns, the Brooklyn pounds away, and proudly flies the flag of stars aloft o'er Mobile Bay. Behold yon moving mass of iron beyond the Ossipee, to fight the fleet with courage grim steams forth the Tennessee. We hem her in with battle fire, how furious grows the fray, until surrender's flag she flies above red Mobile Bay. We count our dead, we count our scars, the proudest ever won. We cheer the flag that gaily flies, victorious in the sun. No longer in the rigging stands the hero of the day, for he has linked his name for heir to deathless Mobile Bay. 
thus i would weave a wreath for all who fought with us that time and i'd embalm that glorious day for evermore in rhyme the stars above will rise and set the years will pass away but brighter all the time shall grow the fame of mobile bay he sleeps the bluff old commodore who led with hearty will but ah methinks i see him now lashed to the rigging still i know that just beyond the tide in god's own glorious day he waits to greet the gallant tars who fought in mobile bay the ships were brought to anchor and breakfast was being served when the great confederate ram tennessee was seen advancing at full speed to attack the whole fleet a terrific struggle followed in which nearly every one of the union ships was badly damaged but the tennessee at last became unmanageable and was forced to surrender the task of reducing the forts remained this was completed in a few days and the port of mobile was effectually closed the bay fight mobile harbor august fifth eighteen sixty four three days through sapphire seas we sailed the steady trade blew strong and free the northern light his banners paled the ocean stream our channels wet we rounded low canaveral's lee and passed the isles of emerald set in blue bahamas turquoise sea by reef and shoal obscurely mapped the hauntings of the gray sea wolf the palmy western key lay lapped in the warm washing of the gulf but wearied to the hearts of all the burning glare the barren reach of santa rosa's withered beach and pensacola's ruined wall and weary was the long patrol the thousand miles of shapeless strand from brazos to san blas that roll their drifting dunes of desert sand yet coastwise as we cruised or lay the land breeze still at nightfall bore by beach and fortress guarded bay sweet odors from the enemy's shore fresh from the forest solitudes unchallenged of his sentry lines the bursting of his cypress buds and the warm fragrance of his pines ah never braver bark and crew nor bolder flag a foe to dare had left a wake on ocean blue since lionheart sailed trunk le mer but little gain by that dark ground was ours save sometime freer breath for friend or brother strangely found scaped from the drear domain of death and little venture for the bold or laurel for our valiant chief save some blockaded british thief full fraught with murder in his hold caught unawares at ebb or flood or dull bombardment day by day with fort and earth at work far away though couched in sullen leagues of mud a weary time but to the strong the day at last as ever came and the volcano laid so long leaped forth in thunder and in flame man your starboard battery kimberly shouted the ship with her hearts of oak was going mid roar and smoke on to victory none of us doubted no not our dying farragut's flag was flying gaines growled low on our left morgan roared on our right before us gloomy and fell with breath like the fume of hell lay the dragon of iron shell driven at last to the fight ha old ship do they thrill the brave two hundred scars you got in the river wars that were leached with clamorous skill surgery savage and hard splinted with bolt and beam probed in scarfing and seam rudely linted and tarred with oakum and boiling pitch and sutured with splice and hitch at the brooklyn navy yard our lofty spars were down to bide the battle's frown want of old renown but every ship was dressed in her bravest and her best as if for a july day sixty flags and three as we floated up the bay at every peak and masthead flew the brave red white and blue we were eighteen ships that day with hawsers strong and taut the weaker lashed to port on we sailed two by two that if either a bolt should feel crash through cauldron or wheel fin of bronze or sinew of steel her mate might bear her through forging boldly ahead the great flagship led grandest of sights on her lofty mizzen flew our leader's dauntless blue that had waved o'er twenty fights so we went with the first of the tide slowly mid the roar of the rebel guns ashore and the thunder of each full broadside ah how poor the prate of statute and state we once held these fellows 
Here on the flood's pale green, hark how he bellows, each bluff old sea lawyer. Talk to them Dahlgren, Parrot, and Sawyer. On in the whirling shade of the cannon's sulphury breath, we drew to the line of death that our devilish foe had laid. Meshed in a horrible net and baited villainous well, right in our path were set three hundred traps of hell. And there, O oh sight forlorn, there, while the cannon hurtled and thundered, ah, what ill raven flapped o'er the ship that morn! Caught by the under death in the drawing of a breath, down went dauntless craven, he and his hundred. A moment we saw her turret, a little heel she gave, and a thin white spray went o'er her like the crest of a breaking wave. In that great iron coffin, the channel for their grave, the fort their monument seen afar in the offing, ten fathom deep lie craven and the bravest of our brave. Then in that deadly track a little the ships held back, closing up in their stations. There are minutes that fix the fate of battles and of nations, christening the generations. When valor were all too late, if a moment's doubt be harbored, from the main top, bold and brief, came the word of our grand old chief. Go on, twas all he said. Our helm was put to starboard, and the Hartford passed ahead. Ahead lay the Tennessee, on our starboard bow he lay, with his mail-clad consorts three, the rest had run up the bay. There he was, belching flame from his bow, and the steam from his throat's abyss, was a dragon's maddened hiss, in sooth a most cursed craft, in a sullen ring at bay, by the middle ground they lay, raking us fore and aft. Trust me, our berth was hot, a uh, wickedly well they shot, how their death bolts howled and stung, and the water batteries played with their deadly cannonade, till the air around us rung. So the battle raged and roared, ah, had you been aboard, to see the fight we made, how they leapt the tongues of flame from the cannon's fiery lip, how the broadsides, deck, and frame shook the great ship, and how the enemy's shell came crashing heavy and oft, clouds of splinters flying aloft and fallen in oaken showers. But ah, the pluck of the crew! Had you stood on that deck of ours, you had seen what men may do. Still as the fray grew louder, boldly they worked and well, steadily came the powder, steadily came the shell and if tackle or truck found hurt quickly they cleared the wreck and the dead were laid to port all a row on our deck never a nerve that failed never a cheek that paled not a tinge of gloom or pallor there was bold kentucky's grit and the old virginian valor and the daring yankee wit there were blue eyes from turfy shannon there were black orbs from palmy niger but there alongside the cannon each man fought like a tiger a little once it looked ill, our consort began to burn. They quenched the flames with a will, but our men were falling still, and still the fleet were astern. Right abreast of the fort, in an awful shroud they lay, broadsides thundering away, and lightning from every port. Scene of glory and dread, a storm-cloud all aglow, with flashes of fiery red, the thunder raging below, and the forest of flags overhead. So grand the hurly and roar, so fiercely their broadsides blazed, the regiments fighting ashore forgot to fire as they gazed. There to silence the foe, moving grimly and slow, they loomed in that deadly wreath, where the darkest batteries frowned, death in the air all around, and the black torpedoes beneath. And now as we looked ahead, all forward the long white deck was growing a strange dull red, but soon, as once and again, fore and aft we sped, the firing to guide or check. You could hardly choose but tread on the ghastly human wreck, dreadful gobbet and shred, that a minute ago were men. Red from mainmast to bits, red on bulwark and whale, red by combing and hatch, red or netting and veil. And ever with steady con the ship forged slowly by, and ever the crew fought on and their cheers rang loud and high grand was the sight to see how by their guns they stood right in front of our dead fighting square abreast each brawny arm and chest all spotted with black and red chrism of fire and blood worth our watch dull and sterile worth all the weary time worth the woe and the peril to stand in that strait sublime 
Fear, a forgotten form. Death, a dream of the eyes. We were atoms in God's great storm that roared through the angry skies. One only doubt was ours, one only dread we knew. Could the day that dawned so well go down for the darker powers? Would the fleet get through? And ever the shot and shell came with the howl of hell. The splinter clouds rose and fell, and the long line of corpses grew. Would the fleet win through? They are men that never will fail how aforetime they've fought. But murder may yet prevail, they may sink as craven sank. Therewith one hard fierce thought, burning on heart and lip, ran like fire through the ship. Fight her to the last plank. A dimmer renown might strike, if death lay square alongside. But the old flag has no like, she must fight whatever be tied. When the war is a tale of old, and this day's story is told, they shall hear how the Hartford died. But as we ranged ahead, and the leading ships worked in, losing their hope to win, the enemy turned and fled. And one seeks a shallow reach, and another winged in her flight, our mate brave Jewett brings in, and one, all torn in the fight, runs for a wreck on the beach, where her flames soon fire the night. And the ram went well up the bay, and we looked that our stems should meet. He had us fair for a prey, shifting his helm midway, sheared off and ran for the fleet. There, without skulking or sham, he fought them gun for gun, and ever he sought to ram, but could finish never a one. From the first of the iron shower, till we sent our parting shell, t'was just one savage hour of the roar and rage of hell. With the lessening smoke and thunder, our glasses around we aim. What is that burning yonder? Our Philippi aground and in flame. Below t'was still all a roar as the ships went by the shore, but the fire of the fort had slacked, so fierce their volleys had been. And now with a mighty din the whole fleet came grandly in, though sorely battered and racked. So up the bay we ran, the flag to port and ahead, and a pitying rain began to wash the lips of our dead. A league from the fort we lay and deemed that the end must lag, when, lo, looking down the bay, there flaunted the rebel rag. The ram is again under way and heading dead for the flag. Steering up with the stream, boldly his course he lay, though the fleet all answered his fire, and, as he still drew nigher, ever on bow and beam our monitors pounded away, how the Chickasaw hammered away. Quickly breasting the wave, eager the prize to win, first of us all the brave Monongahela went in. Under full head of steam, twice she struck him a beam, till her stem was a sorry work, she might have run on a crag. The Lackawanna hit fair, he flung her aside like a cork, and still he held for the flag. High in the mizzen shroud, lest the smoke his sight o'erwhelm, our admiral's voice rang loud, Hard a starboard your helm, starboard and run him down. Starboard it was, and so, like a black squall's lifting frown, our mighty bow bore down on the iron beak of the foe. We stood on the deck together, men that had looked on death in battle and stormy weather. Yet a little we held our breath, when with the hush of death the great ships drew together. Our captain strode to the bow, Drayton, courtly and wise, kindly, cynic and wise. You hardly had known him now, the flame of fight in his eyes. His brave heart eager to feel how the oak would tell on the steel. But as the space grew short, a little he seemed to shun us, out peered a form grim and lanky, and a voice yelled, Hard a port! Hard a port! Here's the damned Yankee coming right down on us. He sheared, but the ships ran foul with a gnarring shudder and growl. He gave us a deadly gun, but as he passed in his pride, rasping right alongside, the old flag in thunder tones poured in her port broadside, rattling his iron hide and cracking his timber bones. Just then, at speed on the foe, with her bow all weathered and brown, the great Lackawanna came down, full tilt for another blow. We were forging ahead. She reversed, but, for all our pains, rammed the old Hartford instead, just forward the mizzen chains. 
Ah, how the mast did buckle and bend, and the stout hull ring and reel, as she took us right on the end. Vain were engine and wheel, she was under full steam. With the roar of a thunderstroke, her two thousand tons of oak brought up on us right abeam. A wreck as it looked we lay, rib and plank shear gave way to the stroke of that giant wedge. Here, after all we go, the old ship is gone, ah, no, but cut to the water's edge. Never mind, then, at him again, his flurry now can't last long. He'll never again see land. Try that on him, Marchand, on him again, brave, strong. Heading square at the hulk, full on his beam we bore, but the spine of the huge sea-hog lay on the tide like a log. He vomited flame no more. By this he had found it hot. Half the fleet in an angry ring closed round the hideous thing, hammering with solid shot, and bearing down, bow on bow, he has but a minute to choose, life or renown, which now will the rebel admiral lose. Cruel, haughty, and cold, he ever was strong and bold. Shall he shrink from a wooden stem? He will think of that brave band he sank in the Cumberland. Aye, he will sink like them. Nothing left but to fight, boldly his last sea fight. Can he strike? By heaven, tis true. Down comes the traitor blue, and up goes the captive white. Up went the white. Ah, then, the hurrahs that once and again rang from three thousand men, all flushed and savage with fight. Our dead lay cold and stark, but our dying down in the dark answered as best they might, lifting their poor lost arms and cheering for God and right. Ended the mighty noise, thunder of forts and ships. Down we went to the hold, O oh, our dear dying boys. How we pressed their poor brave lips, ah, so pallid and cold, and held their hands to the last, those who had hands to hold. Still thee, O oh woman heart, so strong an hour ago, if the idle tears must start, tis not in vain they flow. They died, our children dear, on the drear birth deck they died. Do not think of them here, even now their footsteps near, even now their footsteps near the immortal tender sphere, land of love and cheer, home of the crucified. And the glorious deed survives, our three score, quiet and cold, lie thus, for a myriad lives and treasure millions untold, labor of poor men's lives, hunger of weans and wives, such is war wasted gold. Our ship and her fame to-day shall float on the storied stream, when mast and shroud have crumbled away, and her long white deck is a dream. One daring leap in the dark, three mortal hours at the most, and hell lies stiff and stark on a hundred leagues of coast. For the mighty gulf is ours, the bay is lost and won, an empire is lost and won. Land, if thou yet hast flowers, twine them in one more wreath of tenderest white and red twin buds of glory and death, for the brows of our brave dead, for the navy's noblest son. Joy, O land, for thy sons, victors by flood and field, the traitor walls and guns have nothing left but to yield. Even now they surrender, and the ships shall sail once more, and the cloud of war sweep on to break on the cruel shore. But Craven is gone, he and his hundred are gone. The flags flutter up and down at sunrise and twilight dim, the cannons menace and frown, but never again for him, him and the hundred. The Dahlgrens are dumb, dumb are the mortars, never more shall the drum beat to colors and quarters, the great guns are silent. O brave heart and loyal, let all your colors dip, mourn him, proud ship, from main deck to royal, God rest our captain, rest our last hundred. Droop, flag, and pennant, what is your pride for? Heaven that he died for, rest our lieutenant, rest our brave threescore. O mother land, this weary life we led, we lead, is long of thee. Thine the strong agony of strife, and thine the lonely sea. Thine the long decks all slaughter sprent, the weary rows of cots that lie, with wrecks of strong men marred and rent neath Pensacola's sky. And thine the iron caves and dens where in the flame our wharf fleet drives, the fiery vaults whose breath is men's most dear and precious lives. 
ah ever when with storm sublime dread nature clears our murky air thus in the crash of falling crime some lesser guilt must share full red the furnace fires must glow that melt the ore of mortal kind the mills of god are grinding slow but ah how close they grind to-day the dahlgren and the drum are dread apostles of his name his kingdom here can only come by chrism of blood and flame be strong already slants the gold athwart these wild and stormy skies from out this blackened waste behold what happy homes shall rise but see thou well no traitor glows no striking hands with death and shame betray the sacred blood that flows so freely for thy name and never fear a victor foe thy children's hearts are strong and high nor mourn too fondly while well they know on deck or field to die nor shalt thou want one willing breath though ever smiling round the brave the blue sea bear us on to death the green were one wide grave henry howard brownell one more naval action remains to be recorded the blockading fleet on the carolina coast had been constantly threatened by the confederate ram albemarle finally late in october eighteen sixty four lieutenant william b cushing undertook to destroy it on the night of october twenty seventh he entered plymouth harbor in a small boat with a crew of thirteen men approached the ram and despite a hail of bullets exploded a torpedo under its bow sinking it cushing and most of his men escaped by leaping into the water albemarle cushing october twenty seventh eighteen sixty four joy in rebel plymouth town in the spring of sixty four when the albemarle down on the yankee frigates bore with the saucy stars and bars at her main when she smote the south field dead and the stout miami quailed and the fleet in terror fled when their mighty cannon hailed shot and shell on her iron back in vain till she slowly steeled away to her berth at plymouth pier and their quick eye saw her sway with her great beak out of gear and the color of their courage rose again all the summer lay the ram like a wounded beast at bay while the watchful squadrons swam in the harbor night and day till the broken beak was mended and the weary vigil ended and her time was come again to smite and slay must they die and die in vain like a flock of shambled sheep then the yankee grit and brain must be dead or gone to sleep and our sailors gallant history of a hundred years of glory let us sell for a song selling cheap cushing scarce a man in years but a sailor thoroughbred with a dozen volunteers i will sink the ram he said at the worst tis only dying and the old commander sighing tis to save the fleet and flag go ahead bright the rebel beacons blazed on the river left and right wide awake their sentries gazed through the watches of the night sharp their challenge rang and fiery came the rifle's quick inquiry as the little launch swung into the light listening ears afar had heard ready hands to quarters sprung the albemarle awoke and stirred and her howitzers gave tongue till the river and the shore echoed back the mighty roar when the portals of her hundred pounders swung will the swordfish brave the whale doubly girt with boom and chain face the shrapnel's iron hail dare the livid leaden rain ah that shell has done its duty it has spoiled the yankee's beauty see her turn and fly with half her madmen slain high the victor's taunting yell rings above the battle roar and they bid her mock farewell as she seeks the farther shore till they see her sudden swinging crouching for the leap and springing back to boom and chain and bloody fray once more now the southern captain stirred by the spirit of his race stops the firing with a word bids them yield and offers grace cushing laughing answers no we are here to fight and so swings the dread torpedo spar to its place then the great ship shook and reeled with a wounded gaping side but her steady cannon peeled ere she settled in the tide and the roanoke's dull flood ran full red with yankee blood when the fighting albemarle sunk and died woe in rebel plymouth town when the albemarle fell and the saucy flag went down that had floated long and well never more from her stricken deck to wave for the fallen flag a sigh for the fallen foe a tear never shall their glory die while we hold our glory dear 
and the hero's laurels live on his grave link their cooks with cushing's name proudly call them both our own claim their valor and their fame for america alone joyful mother of the bravest of the brave james jeffrey roche at the cannon's mouth destruction of the ram abemarle by the torpedo launch october twenty seventh eighteen sixty four palely intent he urged his keel full on the guns and touched the spring himself involved in the bolt he drove timed with the armed hulls shot that stove his shallop die or do into the flood his life he threw yet lives unscathed a breathing thing to marvel at he has his fame but that mad dash at death how name had earth no charm to stay the boy from the martyr passion could he dare disdain the paradise of opening joy which beckons the fresh heart everywhere life has more lures than any girl for youth and strength puts forth a share of beauty hinting of yet rarer store and ever with unfathomable eyes which bafflingly entice still strangely does adonis draw and life once over who shall tell the rest life is of all we know god's best what imps these eagles then that they fling disrespect on life by that proud way in which they soar above our lower clay pretense of wonderment and doubt unblessed in cushing's eager deed was shown a spirit which brave poets own that scorn of life which earns life's crown earns but not always wins but he the star ascended in his nativity herman melville End of chapter 11「Chapter 12 of Poems of American History Volume 4 The Civil War This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano Poems of American History, Volume 4, The Civil War, by Various Section 12, The Martyr President In November 1864, Abraham Lincoln was re-elected president, carrying 22 out of the 25 states of the Union. He had grown ever dearer to the hearts of the American people, and the country had come to trust and love him. Lincoln Chained by stern duty to the rock of state, his spirit armed in mail of rugged mirth, ever above, though ever near to earth, yet felt his heart the cruel tongues that sate, base appetites, and foul with slander wait, till the keen lightnings bring the awful hour, when wounds and suffering shall give them power. Most was he, like to Luther, gay and great, solemn and mirthful, strong of heart and limb, tender and simple, too, he was so near, to all things human that he cast out fear and ever simpler like a little child lived in unconsciousness nearness unto him who always on earth's little ones hath smiled s weir mitchell on the evening of april fourteenth eighteen sixty five the president attended a performance of our american cousin at Ford's Theatre at Washington. The play was drawing to a close, when suddenly the audience was startled by a pistol shot, and an instant later saw a man leap from the President's box to the stage. The man was John Wilkes Booth, an actor. He had shot the President through the head, and the latter died next day without regaining consciousness. O Captain, my Captain, April 14, 1865 O Captain, my Captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack, the prize we sought is won. The port is near, 
the bells I hear, the people all exulting. While follow eyes the steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. But O oh, heart, 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 O oh, the bleeding drops of red, Where on the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold and dead. O oh, captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up, for you the flag is flung, for you the bugle trills. For you bouquets and ribbon wreaths, for you the shores are crowding. For you they call the swaying mass, their eager faces turning. Here, Captain, dear father, this arm beneath your head. It is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm. He has no pulse nor will. The ship is anchored safe and sound, its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip the victor ship comes in with object won. Exult, O shores, and ring, O bells, but I, with mournful tread, walk the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold and dead. Walt Whitman The Dead President were there no crowns on earth, no evergreen to wreathe a hero's wreath, that he must pass beyond the gates of death, our hero, our slain hero, to be crowned? Could there on our unworthy earth be found, not to befit his worth? The noblest soul of all, when was there ever, since our Washington, a man so pure, so wise, so patient, one who walked with his high goal alone in sight to speak to do to sanction only right though very heaven should fall ah not for him we weep but honor more could be in store for him who would have had him linger in our dim and troublesome world when his great work was done who would not leave that worn and weary one gladly to go to sleep for us the stroke was just we were not worthy of that patient heart we might have helped him more not stood apart and coldly criticized his works and ways too late now all too late our little praise sounds hollow o'er his dust be merciful o oh our god forgive the meanness of our human hearts that never till a noble soul departs see half the worth or hear the angel's wings till they go rustling heavenward as he springs up from the mounded sod yet what a deathless crown of northern pine and southern orange flower for victory in the land's new bridal hour would we have wreathed for that beloved brow Sadly, upon his sleeping forehead now, we lay our cypress down. O martyred one, farewell. Thou hast not left thy people quite alone. Out of thy beautiful life there comes a tone of power, of love, of trust, a prophecy, whose fair fulfillment all the earth shall be, and all the future tell. Edward Roland Sill Abraham Lincoln assassinated Good Friday, 1865 Forgive them, for they know not what they do, he said, and so went shriven to his fate. Unknowing went that generous heart and true. Even while he spoke, the slayer lay in wait. And when the morning opened heaven's gate, there passed the whitest soul a nation knew. Henceforth all thoughts of pardon are too late. They, in whose cause that arm its weapon drew, have murdered mercy. Now alone shall stand blind justice, with the sword unsheathed she wore. Hark, from the eastern to the western strand, the swelling thunder of the people's roar. What words they murmur, 
fetter not her hand so let it smite such deeds shall be no more edmund clarence stedman the assassin escaped into maryland where he found a temporary refuge but the country was alarmed pursuers were close upon his trail and on april twenty five eighteen sixty five he was brought to bay in a barn he refused to surrender and was shot by a sergeant named boston corbett pardon wilkes booth april twenty six eighteen sixty five pains the sharp sentence the heart in whose wrath it was uttered now thou art cold vengeance the headlong and justice with purpose close muttered loosen their hold death brings atonement he did that whereof ye accuse him murder accursed but from that crisis of crime in which satan did lose him suffered the worst harshly the red dawn arose on a deed of his doing never to mend but harsher days he wore out in the bitter pursuing and the wild end so lift the pale flag of truce wrap those mysteries round him and whose avail madness that moved and the swift retribution that found him falter and fail so the soft purples that quiet the heavens with morning willing to fall lend him one fold his illustrious victim adorning with wider pall back to the cross where the saviour uplifted and dying bade all souls live turns the rough bosom of nature his mother low sighing greatest forgive julia ward howell on wednesday april nineteenth eighteen sixty five a simple funeral service was held over the body of lincoln at the white house and for two days thereafter the body lay in state in the rotunda of the capitol the dear president abraham lincoln the dear president lay in the round hall at the capitol and there the people came to look their last there came the widow weeded for her mate there came the mother sorrowing for her son there came the orphan moaning for its sire there came the soldier bearing home his wound there came the slave who felt his broken chain there came the mourners of a blackened land through the dark april day a ceaseless throng they passed the coffin saw the sleeping face and blessing it in silence moved away and one a poet spoke within his heart it harmed him not to praise him when alive and me it cannot harm to praise him dead too oft the muse has blushed to speak of men no muse shall blush to speak her best of him and still to speak her best of him is dumb o oh, lofty wisdom's low simplicity o oh, awful tenderness of noted power no man e'er held so much of power so meek he was the husband of the husbandless he was the father of the fatherless within his heart he weighed the common woe his call was like a father's to his sons as to a father's voice they hearing came eager to offer strive and bear and die the mild bond breaker servant of his lord he took the sword but in the name of peace and touched the fetter and the bound was free oh place him not among the historic kings strong barbarous chiefs and bloody conquerors but with the great and pure republicans those who have been unselfish wise and good bringers of light and pilots in the dark bearers of crosses servants of the world and always in his land of birth and death be his fond name warmed in the people's hearts abraham lincoln the dear president john james platt 
Abraham Lincoln Oh, slow to smite and swift to spare, gentle and merciful and just, who, in the fear of God, didst bear the sword of power and nation's trust. In sorrow by thy bier we stand, amid the awe that hushes all, and speak the anguish of a land that shook with horror at thy fall. Thy task is done, the bond are free, we bear thee to an honored grave, whose proudest monument shall be the broken fetters of the slave. Pure was thy life, its bloody close, hath placed thee with the sons of light, among the noble host of those who perished in the cause of right. William Cullen Bryant then the funeral train started for Lincoln's home at Springfield, Illinois, stopping at Philadelphia, New York, and other towns along the route, great crowds everywhere gathering to honor the dead president. Abraham Lincoln Not as when some great captain falls in battle, where his country calls, beyond the struggling lines that push his dread designs, to doom by some stray ball struck dead, or in the last charge at the head of his determined men who must be victors then. Nor is when sink the civic great, the safer pillars of the state, whose calm, mature, wise words suppress the need of swords, with no such tears as e'er were shed above the noblest of our dead. Do we today deplore the man that is no more? Our sorrow hath a wider scope, too strange for fear, too vast for hope, a wonder, blind and dumb, that waits what is to come. Not more astounded had we been, if madness, that dark night unseen, had in our chambers crept, and murdered while we slept. We woke to find a morning earth, Our lairs shivered on the hearth, The roof tree fallen all That could affright a pall. Such thunderbolts in other lands Have smitten the rod from royal hands, But spared with us till now Each laureled Caesar's brow. No Caesar he whom we lament, A man without a precedent, Sent it would seem to do his work and perish too. Not by the weary cares of state, The endless tasks which will not wait, Which, often done in vain, must yet be done again. Not in the dark, wild tide of war, Which rose so high and rolled so far, Sweeping from sea to sea in awful anarchy. For fateful years of mortal strife, Which slowly drained the nation's life, Yet for each drop that ran, There sprang an armed man. Not then, but when, by measures meet, By victory and by defeat, By courage, patience, skill, The people's fixed, we will, Had pierced, had crushed rebellion dead, Without a hand, without a head at last when all was well he fell oh how he fell the time the place the stealing shape the coward shot the swift escape the wife the widow's scream it is a hideous dream a dream what means this pageant then these multitudes of solemn men who speak not when they meet but throng the silent street. The flags half-mast that late so high, Flaunted at each new victory, The stars no brightness shed, But bloody looks the red. The black festoons that stretch for miles, And turn the streets to funeral aisles, No house too poor to show The nation's badge of woe. The cannon's sudden, sullen boom, the bells that toll of death and doom, The rolling of the drums, The dreadful car that comes. 
Cursed be the hand that fired the shot, The frenzied brain that hatched the plot, Thy country's father slain, By thee thou worse than Cain. Tyrants have fallen by such as thou, And good hath followed, may it now. God lets bad instruments Produce the best events. But he, the man we mourn to-day, no tyrant was so mild a sway, and one such weight who bore was never known before. Cool should he be of balanced powers, the ruler of a race like ours, impatient, headstrong, wild, the man to guide the child. And this he was, who most unfit, so hard the sense of God to hit, did seem to fill his place with such a homely face, such rustic manners, speech uncouth, that somehow blundered out the truth, untried, untrained to bear, the more than kingly care. Ah, and his genius put to scorn, the proudest in the purple born, whose wisdom never grew, to what untaught he knew. The people of whom he was one, no gentleman like Washington, whose bones methinks make room to have him in their tomb. A laboring man with horny hands, who swung the axe, who tilled his lands, who shrank from nothing new, but did as poor men do. One of the people born to be their curious epitome, to share yet rise above their shifting hate and love. Calm in his mind, it seemed so then, his thoughts the thoughts of other men. Plain were his words and poor, but now they will endure. No hasty fool of stubborn will, but prudent, cautious, pliant still, who since his work was good, would do it as he could. Doubting was not ashamed to doubt, and lacking prescience went without, often appeared to halt, and was, of course, at fault. Heard all opinions, nothing loath, and loving both sides, angered both, was not like justice blind, but watchful, clement, kind. No hero this of Roman mould, nor like our stately sires of old. Perhaps he was not great, but he preserved the state. O honest face, which all men knew, O tender heart, but known to few, O wonder of the age, cut off by tragic rage. Peace, let the long procession come, For hark the mournful, muffled drum, The trumpets wail afar, And see the awful car. Peace, let the sad procession go, While cannon boom, and bells toll slow, And go, thou sacred car, Bearing our woe afar. Go, darkly home, from state to state, Whose loyal, sorrowing cities wait, To honor all they can, The dust of that good man. Go, grandly home, with such a train, As greatest kings might die to gain. The just, the wise, the brave, Attend thee to the grave. And you, the soldiers of our wars, Bronzed veterans, grim with noble scars, Salute him once again, Your late commander slain. Yes, let your tears indignant fall, But leave your muskets on the wall. Your country needs you now, Beside the forge, the plough. When justice shall unsheath her brand, if mercy may not stay her hand, nor would we have it so, she must direct the blow. And you, amid the master race, who seem so strangely out of place, know ye who cometh, he who hath declared ye free. Bow while the body passes, nay, fall on your knees, and weep and pray. Weep, weep, I would ye might, your poor black face is white. And children, you must come in bands, With garlands in your little hands, Of blue and white and red, To strew before the dead. 
so sweetly sadly sternly goes the fallen to his last repose beneath no mighty dome but in his modest home the churchyard where his children rest the quiet spot that suits him best there shall his grave be made and there his bones be laid and there his countrymen shall come with memory proud with pity dumb and strangers far and near for many and many a year for many a year and many an age while history on her ample page the virtues shall enroll of that paternal soul richard henry stoddard during those twenty days the one thought uppermost in men's minds was the martyred president the desire for vengeance alternated with grief it was generally believed that the conspiracy had been concocted by the confederate authorities and magnanimity toward a beaten foe gave place to hatred parricide abraham lincoln april fourteenth eighteen sixty five o'er the warrior gauntlet grim let the silken glove we drew bade the watch-fire slacken dim in the dawn's auspicious hue stayed the armed heel stilled the clanging steel joys unwanted thrilled the silence through glad drew near the easter tide and the thoughts of men anew turned to him who spotless died for the peace that none shall rue out of mortal pain this abiding strain issued peace my peace i give to you musing o'er the silent strings by their apathy oppressed waiting for the spirit wings to be touched and soul possessed i am dull i said treason is not dead still in ambush lurks that shivering guest then a woman's shriek of fear smote us in its arrowy flight and a wonder wild and drear to the hearts of men unite has the seed of crime reached its flowering time that it shoots this audacious height then as frosts the landscape change stiffening from the summer's glow grew the jocund faces strange lay the loftiest emblem low kings are of the past suffered still to last these twin crowns the present did bestow fair assassin murder white with thy serpent speed avoid each unsullied household light every conscience unalloyed neither heart nor home where good angels come suffer thee in nearness to abide slanderer of the gracious brow the untiring blood of youth servant of an evil now of a crime that beggars ruth treason was thy dam woofling when the lamb the anointed met thy venom tooth with the righteous did he fall with the sainted doth he lie while the gibbet's vultures call thee that twixt the earth and sky disavowed of both in their godward troth thou mayest make thy poor amend and die if it were my latest breath doomed his bloody end to share i would brand thee with his death as a deed beyond despair since the christ was lost for a felon's cost none like thee of vengeance should beware leave the murderer noble song helpless in the toils of fate to the just thy meeds belong to the martyr to the state when the storm beats loud over sail and shroud tunefully the seaman cheers his mate never tempest lashed the wave but to leave it fresher calm never weapon scarred the brave but their blood did purchase balm god hath writ on high such a victory as uplifts the nation with its psalm honor to the heart of love honor to the peaceful will slow to threaten strong to move swift to render good for ill glory crowns his end 
and the captive's friend from his ashes makes us freemen still julia ward howe the feeling throughout the south was one of sorrow and indignation in england too the act was condemned and london punch which had delighted in charactering the president published a full-page cartoon depicting itself in the act of laying a wreath upon his bier a cartoon which was followed by some spirited verses from punch's editor tom taylor confessing that the english attitude toward lincoln and the north had been a mistaken one abraham lincoln you lay a wreath on murdered lincoln's bier you who with mocking pencil want to race broad for the self-complacent british sneer his length of shambling limb his furrowed face his gaunt gnarled hands his unkempt bristling hair his garb uncouth his bearing ill at ease his lack of all we prize as debonair of power or will to shine of art to please you whose smart pen backed up the pencil's laugh judging each step as though the way were plain reckless so it could point its paragraph of chief's perplexity or people's pain beside this corpse that bears for winding sheet the stars and stripes he lived to rear anew between the mourners at his head and feet say scurl jester is there room for you yes he had lived to shame me from my sneer to lame my pencil and confute my pen to make me own this hind of prince's peer this rail splitter a true-born king of men by shallow judgment i had learned to rue noting how to occasion's height he rose how his quaint wit made home truth seem more true how iron-like his temper grew by blows how humble yet how hopeful he could be how in good fortune and in ill the same nor bitter in success nor boastful he thirsty for gold nor feverish for fame he went about his work such work as few ever had laid on head and heart and hand as one who knows where there's a task to do man's honest will must heaven's good grace command who trusts the strength will with that burden grow that god makes instruments to work his will if but that will we can arrive to know nor tamper with the weights of good and ill so he went forth to battle on the side he felt clear was liberties and rights as in his pleasant boyhood he had plied his warfare with rude nature's thwarting mites the uncleared forest the unbroken soil the iron bark that turns the lumberer's axe the rapid that o'erbears the boatsman's toil the prairie hiding the mazed wanderer's tracks the ambushed indian and the prowling bear such were the needs that helped his youth to train rough culture but such trees large fruit may bear if but their stocks be of right girth and grain so he grew up a destined work to do and lived to do it for long suffering years ill fate ill feeling ill report lived through and then he heard the hisses change to cheers the taunts to tribute the abuse to praise and took both with the same unwavering mood till as he came on light from darkling days and seemed to touch the goal from where he stood a felon hand between the goal and him reached from behind his back a trigger pressed and those perplexed and patient eyes were dim those gaunt long laboring limbs were laid to rest the words of mercy were upon his lips forgiveness in his heart and on his pen when this vile murderer brought swift eclipse to thoughts of peace on earth good will to men the old world and the new from sea to sea utter one voice of sympathy and shame sore heart so stopped when it at last beat high sad life cut short just as its triumph came a deed accursed strokes have been struck before by the assassin's hand 
whereof men doubt if more of horror or disgrace they bore by thy foul crime like cain's stands darkly out vile hand that brandest murder on a strife whate'er its grounds stoutly and nobly striven and with the martyr's crown crownest the life with much to praise little to be forgiven tom taylor end of section twelve recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Chapter 13 of Poems of American History, Volume 4, The Civil War. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Poems of American History, Volume 4, The Civil War, by Various. Chapter 13, Peace. The surrender of Lee at Appomattox virtually ended the war. The only considerable Confederate force left in the field was that under the command of Johnston, and it surrendered to Sherman on April 26, 1865. Stack Arms by Joseph Blinth Alston Stack Arms, I've gladly heard the cry when, weary with the dusty tread of marching troops, as night drew nigh, I sank upon my soldier bed, and calmly slept, the starry dome of heaven's blue arch my canopy, and mingled with my dream of home the thoughts of peace and liberty. Stack arms! I've heard it when the shout exulting ran along our line, of foes hurled back in bloody rout, captured, dispersed, its tones divine then came to my enraptured ear. Guerdon of duty nobly done, And glistened on my cheek a tear Of grateful joy for victory won. Stack arms. In faltering accents, slow and sad, It creeps from tongue to tongue, A broken, murmuring wail of woe From manly hearts by anguish wrung, like victims of a midnight dream, we move, we know not how nor why, for life and hope like phantoms seem, and it would be relief to die. Jefferson Davis, who had fled from Richmond, was captured on May 11, 1865, near the Okmulgee River in Georgia, and on May 26, when Kirby Smith formally surrendered, the last vestige of armed resistance to national government disappeared. Davis was confined at Fortress Monroe until 1868, the South, of course, considering him a martyr. Jefferson Davis by Walker Merriweather Bell Our hearts, our hopes, our prayers, our tears, our faith triumphant o'er our fears, are all with thee, are all with thee. Longfellow Calm martyr of a noble cause, Upon thy form in vain The dungeon shuts its cankered jaws And clasps its cankered chain. For thy free spirit walks abroad And every pulse is stirred With the old deathless glory thrill Whene'er thy name is heard. The same that lit each Grecian eye, Whene'er it rested on the wild pass of Thermophilae, The plain of Marathon, And made the Roman's ancient blood bound fiercely as he told How well Horatio kept the bridge in the brave days of old. The same that makes the Switzer's heart with silent rapture swell, when in each alpine height he sees a monument to tell, the same that kindles Irish veins when Emmet's name is told, what Bruce to Caledonia is, Kosciuszko to the Pole, art thou to us thy deathless fame 
with washington entwined for ever in each southern heart is hallowed and enshrined and though the tyrant give thy form to shameful death twere vain it would be shed a splendor round the gibbet and the chain only less sacred in our eyes thus blessed and purified than the dear cross on which our lord was shamed and crucified would the vile gallows tree become and through all ages shine linked with the glory of thy name a relic and a shrine it was for the south a sad awakening from the dream which had been so entrancing and which seemed so certain to come true the land was ravaged their people were ruined their best and bravest dead in the land where we were dreaming by daniel b lucas fair were our visions oh they were as grand as ever floated out of fairyland children were we in single faith but godlike children whom no death nor threat nor danger drove from honor's path in the land where we were dreaming proud were our men as pride of birth could render as violets our women pure and tender and when they spoke their voices did thrill until at eve the whippoorwill at morn the mockingbird were mute and still in the land where we were dreaming and we had graves that covered more of glory than ever tracked tradition's ancient story and in our dream we wove the thread of principles for which had bled and suffered long our own immortal dead in the land where we were dreaming though in our land we had both bond and free both were content and so god let them be till envy coveted our land and those fair fields our valor won but little reckoned we for we still slept on in the land where we were dreaming our sleep grew troubled and our dreams grew wild red meteors flashed across our heaven's field crimson the moon between the twins barbed arrows fly and then begins such strife as when disorder's chaos reigns in the land where we were dreaming down from her sunlit heights smiled liberty and waved her cap in sign of victory the world approved and everywhere except where growled the russian bear the good the brave the just gave us their prayer in the land where we were dreaming we fancied that a government was ours we challenged place among the world's great powers we talked in sleep of rank commission until so lifelike grew our vision that he who dared to doubt but met derision in the land where we were dreaming we looked on high a banner there was seen whose field was blanched and spotless in its sheen chivalry's cross its union bears and veterans swearing by their scars vowed they would bring it through a hundred wars in the land where we were dreaming a hero came amongst us as we slept at first he lowly knelt then rose and wept then gathering up a thousand spears he swept across the field of mars then bowed farewell and walked beyond the stars in the land where we were dreaming we looked again another figure still gave hope and nerved each individual will full of grandeur clothed with powder self-poised erect he ruled the hour with stern majestic sway a strength of tower in the land where we were dreaming and while great jove in bronze a warder god gazed eastward from the forum where he stood rome felt herself secure and free so richmond's safe we said while we beheld a bronzed hero godlike thee in the land where we were dreaming as wakes the soldier when the alarum calls as wakes the mother when the infant falls as starts the traveller when around his sleeping couch the fire bells sound so woke our nation with a single bound in the land where we were dreaming 
Woe, woe is me, the startled mother cried. While we have slept, our noble sons have died. Woe, woe is me, how strange and sad that all our glorious visions fled and left us nothing real but the dead in the land where we were dreaming. Acceptation by Margaret Junkin Preston 1. We do accept thee, heavenly peace, albeit thou comest in a guise unlooked for, undesired. Our eyes welcome through tears the sweet release from war and woe and want. Surcease, for which we bless thee, blessed peace. 2. We lift our foreheads from the dust, and as we meet thy brow's clear calm, there falls a freshening sense of balm upon our spirits. Fear, distrust, the hopeless present on us thrust, we'll meet them as we can and must. 3. War has not wholly wrecked us. Still strong hands, brave hearts, high souls are ours. Proud consciousness of quenchless powers, a past whose memory makes us thrill, futures uncharactered, to fill with heroisms, if we will. 4. Then courage, brothers. Though each breast feel oft the rankling thorn, despair, that failure plants so sharply there, no pain, no pang shall be confessed, we'll work and watch the brightening west, and leave to God and heaven the rest. THE CONQUERED BANNER by Abram J. Ryan Furl that banner, for tis weary, Round its staff tis drooping dreary. Furl it, fold it, it is best. For there's not a man to wave it, And there's not a sword to save it, And there's not one left to lave it In the blood which heroes gave it, And its foes now scorn and brave it. Furl it, hide it, let it rest. Take that banner down, tis tattered, Broken is its staff and shattered, And the valiant hosts are scattered Over whom it floated high. Oh, tis hard for us to fold it, Hard to think there's none to hold it, Hard that those who once unrolled it Now must furl it with a sigh. Furl that banner, furl it sadly, once ten thousands hailed it gladly, and ten thousands wildly, madly swore it should forever wave, swore that foeman's sword should never hearts like theirs entwined dissever, and that flag should float forever o'er their freedom or their grave. Furl it, for the hands that grasped it, and the hearts that fondly clasped it, cold and dead are lying low. And that banner, it is trailing, while around it sounds the wailing of its people in their woe. For, though conquered, they adore it, love the cold, dead hands that bore it, weep for those who fell before it, pardon those who trailed and tore it, but, oh, wildly they deplore it, now who furl and fold it so. Furl that banner. Tis true gory, yet tis wreathed around with glory, and twill live in song and story, though its folds are in the dust. For its fame on brightest pages, penned by poets and by sages, shall go sounding down the ages, furl its folds, though now we must. Furl that banner, softly, slowly, treat it gently, it is holy. For it droops above the dead. Touch it not, unfold it never, Let it droop there, furled for ever, For its people's hopes are fled. At the North, too, peace was welcomed. The North, while suffering less poignantly than the South, 
had drunk deeply of the bitter cup. It had lost over three hundred and fifty thousand men. Peace by Adeline D. T. Whitney Daybreak upon the hills, slowly, behind the midnight murk and trial of the long storm, light brightens, pure and pale, and the horizon fills. Not bearing swift release, not with quick feet of triumph, but with tread august and solemn, following her dead, cometh at last our peace. Over thick graves grown green, over pale bones that graveless lie and bleach, over torn human hearts her path doth reach, and heaven's dear pity lean. O angel sweet and grand, white-footed from beside the throne of God, thou movest with the palm and olive rod, and day bespreads the land. His day we waited for, with faces to the east, we prayed and fought, and a faint music of the dawning caught all through the sounds of war. Our souls are still with praise. It is the dawning. There is work to do. When we have borne the long hour's burden through, then we will pay ends raise. God give us, with the time, his strength for his large purpose to the world, to bear before him in face unfurled, his gonfalon sublime. Ay, we are strong. Both sides the misty river stretch his army's wings. Heavenward, with glorious wheel, one flank he flings, and one front still abides. Strongest where most bereft, his great ones he doth call to more command. For whom he hath prepared it, they shall stand, on the right hand and the left. Peace by Phoebe Carey O land, of every land the best, O land, whose glory shall increase, Now in your whitest raiment dressed For the great festival of peace. Take from your flag its fold of gloom, And let it float undimmed above, till over all our vale shall bloom the sacred colors that we love. On mountain high, in valley low, set freedom's living fires to burn, until the midnight sky shall show a redder pathway than the morn. Welcome, with shouts of joy and pride, your veterans from the war paths track. You gave your boys, untrained, untried, you bring them men and heroes back. And shed no tear, though think you must with sorrow of the martyred band, not even for him whose hallowed dust has made our prairies holy land. Though by the places where they fell, the places that are sacred ground, death, like a sudden sentinel, paces his everlasting round. Yet when they set their country free and gave her traitor's fitting doom, they left her last great enemy baffled beside an empty tomb. Not there, but risen, redeemed. They go where all the paths are sweet with flowers. They fought to give us peace, and lo, they gained a better peace than ours. On May 24, 1865, the United Armies of Grant and Sherman, 200,000 strong, were reviewed at Washington by President Johnson and his cabinet. A Second Review of the Grand Army by Bret Hart May 24, 1865 I read last night of the Grand Review in Washington's chiefest avenue, Two hundred thousand men in blue, I think they said was the number. Till I seemed to hear their trampling feet, the bugle blast and the drum's quick beat, the clatter of hoofs on the stony street, the cheers of people who came to greet, and the thousand details that to repeat would only my verse encumber, till I fell in a reverie, sad and sweet, and then to a fitful slumber. 
when lo in a vision i seemed to stand in the lonely capital on each hand far stretched the portico dim and grand its columns ranged like a martial band of sheeted spectres whom some command had called to a last reviewing and the streets of the city were white and bare no footfall echoed across the square but out of the misty midnight air I heard in the distance a trumpet blare, and the wandering night winds seemed to bear the sound of a far tattooing. Then I held my breath with fear and dread, for into the square with a brazen tread there rode a figure whose stately head o'erlooked the review that morning. That never bowed from its firm-set seat when the living column passed its feet, yet now rode steadily up the street to the phantom bugle's warning till it reached the capitol square and wheeled and there in the moonlight stood revealed a well-known form that in state and field had led our patriot sires whose face was turned to the sleeping camp afar through the river's fog and damp that showed no flicker no warning lamp nor wasted bouviac fires and I saw a phantom army come, with never a sound of fife or drum, but keeping time to a throbbing hum of wailing and lamentation. The martyred heroes of Malvern Hill, of Gettysburg and Chancellorsville, the men whose wasted figures fill the patriot graves of the nation. And there came the nameless dead, the men who perished in fever swamp and fen, the slowly starved of the prison pen, and, marching beside the others, came the dusky martyrs of Pillow's fight, with limbs enfranchised and bearing bright. I thought, perhaps t'was the pale moonlight, they looked as white as their brothers. And so all night marched the nation's dead, with never a banner above them spread, nor a badge, nor a motto brandished, no mark save the bare uncovered head of the silent bronze reviewer with never an arch save the vaulted sky with never a flower save those that lie on the distant graves for love could buy no gift that was purer or truer so all night long swept the strange array so all night long till the morning gray i watched for one who had passed away with a reverent awe and wonder till a blue cap waved in the lengthening line and i knew that one who was kin of mine had come and i spake and lo that sign awakened me from my slumber the work of disbandment began at once and the troops were sent home as rapidly as possible they lay by the musket took up the spade or hammer, and returned once more to the occupations of peace. When Johnny Comes Marching Home by Patrick Sarsfield Gilmore When Johnny comes marching home again, hurrah, hurrah, we'll give him a hearty welcome then, hurrah, hurrah. The men will cheer, the boys will shout, the ladies, they will all turn out, and we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. The old church bell will peal with joy, hurrah, hurrah, to welcome home our darling boy, hurrah, hurrah. The village lads and lasses say, with roses they will strew the way, and we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. Get ready for the jubilee, hurrah, hurrah, We'll give the hero three times three, hurrah, hurrah. The laurel wreath is ready now to place upon his loyal brow, and we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. Let love and friendship on that day, hurrah, hurrah, their choicest treasures then display, hurrah, hurrah, and let each one perform some part to fill with joy the warrior's heart, and we'll all feel gay when Johnny comes marching home. Driving Home the Cows by Kate Putnam Osgood 
Out of the clover and blue-eyed grass, he turned them into the river lane. One after another he let them pass, then fastened the meadow bars again. Under the willows and over the hill, he patiently followed their sober pace. The merry whistle for once was still, and something shadowed the sunny face. Only a boy, and his father had said he never could let his youngest go. Two already were lying dead under the feet of the trampling foe. But after the evening work was done, and the frogs were loud in the meadow swamp, over his shoulder he slung his gun, and stealthily followed the footpath damp. Across the clover and through the wheat, with resolute heart and purpose grim, though cold was the dew and hurrying his feet, and the blind bats flitting startled him. Thrice since then had the lanes been white, and the orchards sweet with apple bloom, and now, when the cows come back at night, the feeble father drove them home. For news had come to the lonely farm that three were lying where two had lain, and the old man's tremulous, palsied arm could never lean on a son's again. The summer grew cold and late. He went for the cows when the work was done. But down the lane, as he opened the gate, he saw them coming, one by one. Brindle, Ebony, Speckle, and Bess, shaking their horns in the evening wind, cropping the buttercups out of the grass. But who was it following close behind? Loosely swung in the idle air the empty sleeve of army blue, and worn and pale from the crisping hair looked out a face that the father knew. For southern prisons will sometimes yawn and yield their dead unto life again, and the day that comes with a cloudy dawn in golden glory at last may wane. The great tears sprang to their meeting eyes, for the heart must speak when the lips are dumb, and under the silent evening skies, together they followed the cattle home. On July 21, 1865, services were held at Cambridge, Massachusetts, in commemoration of the 300th anniversary of Harvard College. Addresses were made by General Meade and General Devens, and an ode written for the occasion was read by James Russell Lowell. This ode, perhaps the greatest ever delivered in America, forms a fitting close to the history of the Civil War. Ode recited at the Harvard Commemoration by James Russell Lowell, July 21st, 1865. 1. Weaked winged is song, nor aims at that clear ethered height whither the brave deed climbs for light. We seem to do them wrong, bringing our robin's leaf to deck their hearse who in warm life-blood wrote their nobler verse. Our trivial song to honor those who come with ears attuned to strenuous trump and drum, and shaped in squadron strokes their desire. Live battle odes whose lines were steel and fire, yet sometimes feathered words are strong, a gracious memory to buoy up and save from Lee's dreamless ooze, the common grave of the unventurous throng. 2. Today our reverend mother welcomes back her wisest scholars, those who understood the deeper teaching of her mystic tome, and offered their fresh lives to make it good. No lore of Greece or Rome, no science peddling with the names of things, or reading stars to find in glorious fates, can lift our life with wings far from death's idle gulf that for the many waits, and lengthen out our dates with that clear fame whose memory sings in manly hearts to come, and nerves them, and dilates. Nor such teaching, mother of us all, not such the trumpet call of thy diviner mood, that could thy sons entice from happy homes and toils the fruitless nest of those half-virtues which the world calls best, into war's tumult rude, but rather far that stern device the sponsors chose that round thy cradle stood in the dim, unventured wood, the veritas 
that lurks beneath the letter's unprolific sheath life of whate'er makes life worth living seed grain of high enterprise immortal food one heavenly thing whereof earth hath the giving three many loved truth and lavished life's best oil amid the dust of books to find her content at last for guerdon of their toil with the cast mantle she hath left behind her many in sad faith sought for her many with crossed hands sighed for her but these our brothers fought for her at life's dear peril wrought for her so loved her that they died for her testing the raptured fleetness of her divine completeness their higher instinct knew those love her best who to themselves are true and what they dare to dream of dare to do they followed her and found her where all may hope to find not in the ashes of the burnt-out mind but beautiful with danger's sweetness round her where faith made whole with deed breathes its awakening breath into the lifeless creed they saw her plumed and mailed with sweet stern face unveiled and all repaying eyes look proud on them in death Four. our slender life runs rippling by and glides into the silent hollow of the past what is there that abides to make the next age better for the last is earth too poor to give us something to live for here that shall outlive us some more substantial boon than such as flows and ebbs with fortune's fickle moon the little that we see from doubt is never free the little that we do is but half nobly true with our laborious hiving what men call treasure and the gods call dross life seems a jest of fate's contriving only secure in every one's conniving a long account of nothing paid with loss where we poor puppets jerked by unseen wires after our little hour of strut and rave with all our pasteboard passions and desires loves hates ambitions and immortal fires are tossed pell-mell together in the grave but stay no age was e'er degenerate unless men held it at too cheap a rate for in our likeness still we shape our fate ah there is something here unfathomed by the cynic's sneer something that gives our feeble light a high immunity from night something that leaps life's narrow bars to claim its birthright with the host of heaven a seed of sunshine that can leaven our earthly dullness with the beams of stars and glorify our clay with light from fountains elder than the day a conscience more divine than we a gladness fed with secret tears a vexing far-reaching sense of some more noble permanence a light across the sea which haunts the soul and will not let it be still beaconing from the heights of undegenerate years five whither leads the path to ampler fates that leads not down through flowery meads to reap an aftermath of youth's vainglorious weeds but up the steep amid the wrath and shock of deadly hostile creeds where the world's best hope and stay by battle's flashes gropes a desperate way and every turf the fierce foot clings to bleeds peace hath her not ignoble wreath ere yet the sharp decisive word light the black lips of cannon and the sword dreams in its easeful sheath but some day the live coal behind the thought whether from baal's stone obscene or from the shrine serene of god's pure altar brought bursts up in flame the war of tongue and pen learns with what deadly purpose it was fraught and helpless in the fiery passion caught 
shakes all the pillared state with shock of men some day the soft ideal that we wooed confronts us fiercely foe beset pursued and cries reproachful was it then my praise and not myself was loved prove now thy truth i claim of thee the promise of thy youth give me thy life or cower in empty phrase the victim of thy genius not its mate life may be given in many ways and loyalty to truth be sealed as bravely in the closet as the field so bountiful is fate but then to stand beside her when craven curls deride her to front a lie in arms and not to yield this shows me think god's plan and measure of a stalwart man limbed like the old heroic breeds who stands self-poised on manhood's solid earth not forced to frame excuses from his birth fed from within with all the strength he needs six such was he our martyr chief whom late the nation he had led with ashes on her head wept with the passion of an angry grief forgive me if from present things i turn to speak what in my heart will beat and burn and hang my wreath on his world-honoured urn nature they say doth dote and cannot make a man save on some worn-out plan repeating us by rote for him her old world moulds aside she threw and choosing sweet clay from the breast of the unexhausted west with stuff untainted shaped a hero new wise steadfast in the strength of god and true how beautiful to see once more a shepherd of mankind indeed who loved his charge but never loved to lead one whose meek flock the people joyed to be not lured by any cheat of birth but by his clear-grained human worth and brave old wisdom of sincerity they knew that outward grace is dust they could not choose but trust in that sure-footed mind's unfaltering skill and supple tempered will that bent like perfect steel to spring again and thrust he was no lonely mountain peak of mind thrusting to thin air o'er our cloudy bars a sea mark now now lost in vapours blind broad prairie rather genial level lined fruitful and friendly for all humankind yet also nigh to heaven and loved of loftiest stars nothing of europe here or then of europe fronting mournward still ere any names of serf and peer could nature's equal scheme deface and thwart her genial will here was a type of the true elder race and one of plutarch's men's talked with us face to face i praise him not it were too late and some innative weakness there must be in him who condescends to victory such as the present gives and cannot wait safe in himself as in a fate so always firmly he he knew to bide his time and can his fame abide still patient in his simple faith sublime till the wise years decide great captains with their guns and drums disturb our judgment for the hour but at last silence comes these are all gone and standing like a tower our children shall behold his fame the kindly earnest brave foreseeing man sagacious patient dreading praise not blame new birth of our new soil the first american seven long as man's hope insatiate can discern or only guess some more inspiring goal outside of self enduring as the pole along whose course the flying axles burn of spirits bravely pitched earth's manlier brood long as below we cannot find the mead that stills the inexorable mind so long this faith to some ideal good 
under whatever mortal names it masks freedom law country this ethereal mood that thanks the fates for their severe tasks feeling its challenged pulses leap while others skulk in subterfuges cheap and set in danger's van has all the boon it asks shall win man's praise and woman's love shall be a wisdom that we set above all other skills and gifts to culture dear a virtue round whose forehead we enwreathe laurels that with a living passion breathe when other crowns grow while we twine them sear what brings us thronging these high rites to pay and seal these hours the noblest of our year save that our brothers found this better way eight we sit here in the promised land that flows with freedom's honey and milk but twas they won it sword in hand making the nettle danger soft for us as silk we welcome back our bravest and our best ah me not all some come not with the rest who went forth brave and bright as any here i strive to mix some gladness with my strain but the sad strings complain and will not please the ear i sweep them for a paean but they wane again and yet again into a dirge and die away in pain in these brave ranks i only see the gaps thinking of dear ones whom the dumb turf wraps dark to the triumph which they died to gain fitlier may others greet the living for me the past is unforgiving i with uncovered head salute the sacred dead who went and who return not say not so tis not the grapes of canaan that repay but the high faith that failed not by the way virtue treads paths that end not in the grave no ban of endless night exiles the brave and to the saner mind we rather seem the dead that stayed behind blow trumpets all your exultations blow for never shall their aureoled presence lack i see them muster in a gleaming row with ever youthful brows that nobler show we find in our dull road their shining track in every nobler mood we feel the orient of their spirit glow part of our life's unalterable good of all our saintlier aspiration they come transfigured back secure from change in their high-hearted ways beautiful evermore and with the rays of morn on their white shields of expectation nine but is there hope to save even this ethereal essence from the grave whatever scraped oblivion's subtle wrong save a few clarion names or golden threads of song before my musing eye the mighty ones of old swept by disvoiced now and insubstantial things as noisy ones as we poor ghosts of kings shadows of empire wholly gone to dust and many races nameless long ago to darkness driven by that imperious gust of ever-rushing time that here doth blow o visionary world condition strange where not abiding is but only change where the deep bolted stars themselves still shift and range shall we to more continuance make pretense renown builds tombs a life estate is wit and bit by bit the cunning years steal all from us but woe leaves are we whose decay no harvests sow but when we vanish hence still they lie forceless in the dark below save to make green their little lengths of sods or deepen pansies for a year or two who now to us are shining sweet as gods was dying all they had the skill to do that were not fruitless 
but the soul resents such short-lived service as if blind events ruled without her or earth could so endure she claims a more divine investiture of longer tenure than fame's airy rents whate'er she touches doth her nature share her inspiration haunts the ennobled air gives eyes to mountains blind ears to the deaf earth voices to the wind and her clear triumph sings succor everywhere by lonely bouviacs to the wakeful mind for soul inherits all that soul could dare yea manhood hath a wider span and a larger privilege of life than man the single deed the private sacrifice so radiant now through proudly hidden tears is covered up ere long from mortal eyes with thoughtless drift of the deciduous years but that high privilege that makes all men peers that leap of heart whereby all people rise up to a noble anger's height and flamed on by the fates not shrink but grow more bright that swift validity in noble veins of choosing danger and disdaining shame of being set on flame by the pure fire that flies all contact base but wraps its chosen with angelic might these are imperishable gains sure as the sun medicinal as light these hold great futures in their lusty reigns and certify to earth a new imperial race Ten. who now shall sneer who dare again to say we trace our lines to a plebeian race roundhead and cavalier dumb are those names erewhile in battle loud dream-footed as the shadow of a cloud they flit across the ear that is best blood that hath most iron in it to edge resolve with pouring without stint for what makes manhood dear tell us not of platagonets hapsburgs and gulfs whose thin bloods crawl down from some victor in a border brawl how poor their outworn coronets matched with one leaf of that plain civic wreath our brave for honour's blazon shall bequeath through whose desert a rescued nation sets her heel on treason and the trumpet hears shout victory tingling europe's sullen ears with vain resentments and more vain regrets eleven not in anger not in pride pure from passion's mixture rude ever to the base earth allied but with far heard gratitude still with heart and voice renewed to heroes living and dear martyrs dead the strain should close that consecrates our brave lift the heart and lift the head lofty be its mood and grave not without a martial ring not without a prouder tread and appeal of exultation little right has he to sing through whose heart in such an hour beats no march of conscious power sweeps no tumult of elation tis no man we celebrate but his country's victories great a hero half and half the whim of fate but the pith and marrow of a nation drawing force from all her men highest humblest weakest all for her time of need and then pulsing it again through them till the basest can no longer cower feeling his soul spring up divinely tall touched but in passing by her mantle hem come back then noble pride for tis her dower how could poet ever tower if his passions hopes and fears if his triumphs and his tears kept not measure with his people boom cannon boom to all the winds and waves clash out glad bells from every rocking steeple banners advance with triumph bend your staves and from every mountain peak let beacon fire to answering beacon speak katahdin tell monadnock white face he and so leap on in light from sea to sea till the glad news be sent across a kindling continent making earth feel more firm and air breathe braver 
be proud for she is saved and all have helped to save her she that lifts up the manhood of the poor she of the open soul and open door with room about her hearth for all mankind the fire is dreadful in her eyes no more from her bold front the helm she doth unbind sends all her handmaid armies back to spin and bids her navvies that so lately hurled their crashing battle hold their thunders in swimming like birds of calm along the unharmful shore no challenge sends she to the elder world that looked askance and hated a light scorn plays o'er her mouth as round her mighty knees she calls her children back and waits the morn of nobler day enthroned between her subject seas twelve bow down dear land for thou hast found release thy god in these distempered days hath taught thee the sure wisdom of his ways and through thine enemies hath wrought thy peace bow down in prayer and praise no poorest in thy borders but may now lift to the juster skies a man's enfranchised brow o beautiful my country ours once more smoothing thy gold of war dishevelled hair o'er such sweet brows as never other wore and letting thy set lips freed from raz pale eclipse the rosy edges of their smile lay bare what words divine of lover or of poet could tell our love and make thee know it among the nations bright and beyond compare what were our lives without thee what all our lives to save thee we reck not what we gave thee we will not dare to doubt thee but ask whatever else and we will dare End of chapter 13 and End of Poems of American History, Volume 4, The Civil War, by various authors.